uh, last panel of the day. The last panel of the day uh, focuses on the same topic that the prior panel focused on, and uh, unlike the prior panel, we have a little bit more space to work with, both physically and uh, in terms of time. We have two opening presentations. Uh, the first is going to be by John Nectarline, who is a partner and co-leader in uh, Sidley Austin's uh, communications regulatory practice, um, and he also previously served as the general counsel of the FTC and the deputy general counsel of the FCC. Uh, Another presentation following John's is going to be by Carl Shapiro, who was early, introduced earlier this morning, and I won't uh, read his bio again, but he is a professor at the University of California at Berkeley and served as uh, Deputy Assistant Attorney General, uh, head of the Economic Analysis Group at the Department of Justice on two occasions. So John will start us off. Uh, thank you, Derek. Uh, <clears throat> very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to begin with a little history lesson and a riddle. And the riddle is, think of a company, past or present, that uses scale vertical integration and innovation, transform retailing, undersells its rivals, puts many of them out of business, and whose very success prompts calls for radical changes to the nation's antitrust laws. The answer to this question is not Amazon. Uh, Amazon actually has only a small fraction of the sale, retail sales today is Walmart. Um, the answer instead is this company, a and which people my age or older will remember from the 20th century. It was a powerhouse supermarket chain uh, that in 19, by 1929 had really come to dominate retailing in America in a way that no other company had done before. And at this point, I'm going to make two disclosures and a disclaimer. The, dis the first disclosure is that the presentation I'm about to give is based on a paper that my colleague Tim Muris and I wrote that was funded by Amazon. The second disclosure is I worked at AMP as a teenager. That little grocery store, I spent two summers working as a bag boy in the AMP. The disclaimer is I will not let um, all, all views I express here today are my own, not those of any client or former employer. So how did AMP do it? How did it come to dominate retail sales in the early 20th century? Well, AT&T basically had four different strategies. One was ruthless disintermediation. It went around wholesalers. At the time, the grocery business was very segmented into production, wholesaling, and retail dis distribution. AMP went right through the wholesalers, bought directly from suppliers, and therefore was, under able, was able to undersell its, its uh, smaller rivals. Second, AMP also spread throughout the country. It had hundreds of stores. It bought in bulk from producers. It was able to get enormous uh, discounts from them. Uh, third is vertical integration. AMP was not only a distributor, a retail seller of groceries, but it was also a manufacturer of groceries. It, it made butter. It made bread. It imported coffee. And it was also a great innovator. It may come as a surprise to some people to learn that there was a lot of innovation in the early 20th century in retail sales, but in fact there was. AMP learned how to cut costs out of the distribution system, but it also did something that foreshadows what internet companies today do, which is to use consumer data to uh, make its operations more efficient and more receptive to the actual interests of consumers. So who benefited from all this? Well, consumers did who didn't benefit smaller competitors than the displaced middlemen that AT&T went around. And so this, the reason we're I'm going to talk about this case today is because it really does identify sort of an archetypal example of where a company through competition reduces the number of competitors, yet consumers are better off. So if we had an alternative standard called the competitive process standard, where would it leave us? Ultimately, I think that the, um, the consumer welfare, I'm going to defend the consumer welfare standard because I think it gives us a determinate objective uh, that a more nebulous term like competitive process doesn't give us. So um, I'm going to, th there were a number of quick legislative and prosecutorial reactions to AMP over the 
uh, throughout the early and mid 20th century. I'm gonna skip through a few of them just because we don't have a lot of time. I'm just gonna briefly mention them. One is Congress in a variety of states imposed heavy taxes, not just on A&P, but also a lot of other large chain stores so that they could be less successful in underselling uh, smaller mom and pop businesses and other less efficient businesses. Um, there is also the robinson Patman Act, whose mysteries I will not spend a lot of time on today. I still don't feel like I fully understand it, but one key to it is um, the original title of this act, which was the Wholesale Grocers Protection Act. And that is exactly what it was. It was designed to protect wholesalers and smaller retailers uh, against large chain stores and often against the interests of consumers. All right, so now the main event of my presentation is the criminal prosecution of AMP by the Department of Justice. By the way, this is counting down from two minutes. Is I'm going to show you. Yeah, all right, good. Okay, excellent. All right, so here's the main event. Um, the main event is a criminal prosecution. People sometimes forget that the Sherman Act is a criminal statute and enforcement actions can be criminal today. We can find that to Section 1, but that wasn't always the case. And DOJ actually went after... Uh, AMP, the corporation, and its key executives, including the two founders of the modern AMP, for criminal violations and secured felony convictions of them. The, what, were, what was the theory of criminal liability? Well, one was predatory pricing. The theory here was that AMP was pricing its goods too low and putting smaller, less efficient businesses out of the market. Um, but there was never a clear distinction in DOJ's ca case between competitive pricing and predatory pricing. This is a problem that um, afflicted a lot of predatory pricing claims back in the early to mid 20th century. There were no determinative standards, so it ended up being sort of a know it when I see it standard. What there is definitely not was anything comparable to what we would now call the recoupment requirement for plaintiffs. And here is a quote by Morris Edelman, uh, roughly contemporaneous with the prosecution that shows that you really kind of need to have a recoupment requirement in order to show why predatory pricing is a bad thing. Ultimately, the concern is that over the long run, consumers will have to pay more, will be worse off because of short-run price cuts. But that was never going to be a persuasive theory in the AMP case because there was no because the entry barriers were sufficiently low. There was never a realistic scenario in which AMP was going to be able to hike its grocery prices to monopoly levels. Theory number two, DOJ brought, a monopsony theory. Here the theory was that AMP was getting such good deals from grocery suppliers that the suppliers got angry and turned around and raised the rates that they were charging all the independent grocery stores, the smaller ones. Now this is perplexing from an economic perspective because presumably the suppliers were charging profit maximizing rates for the smaller grocery stores in the first place. And it's unclear how it is that A&P was going to be, through its insistence on lower rates, was going to raise the costs of its rivals. DOJ never really tried to prove that. So instead of analysis, we ultimately had rhetoric. This is an actual quote from a prosecutor in the A&P case. It's amazing that you actually had prosecutors saying these things. A&P should be convicted of a criminal offense because it sells food cheaply to consumers in its own stores because it is a gigantic bloodsucker taking its toll from all levels of the industry. Focus on other competitors in the industry rather than on the consumer beneficiaries of AMP's low prices. Third theory of liability was one of vertical integration. As I mentioned, AMP was an early vertical integrator. One of the vertically integrated companies with AMP was um, a company called ACO, which was a purchasing agent. And what this company did is it went around the company and it bought fresh produce directly from farmers and other suppliers. Now, sometimes ACO, this affiliate of AMP, um, bought too much produce and there was some leftover. What did AMP do? What well, didn't throw the spare produce out, it sold it to other other grocery stores, unaffiliated grocers. And obviously it was going to sell the, food, the, the spare produce to those grocers at a profit, so it was charging them more than it charged itself when it sold the produce to the AMP retail stores. But obviously the grocers, these independent grocers didn't need to buy anything from the purchasing agent. It, they chose to because apparently the rates that ACO was charging them 
uh, were below the market rate. So AMP was effectively allowing its competitors to share in its economies of scale. But the linchpin of the case against AMP was that there was something really unseemly about doing business with your competitors, having companies that were simultaneously your competitors and your customers, and not treating them as customers as well as you treat your own operations. And you can see this in a variety of olfactory metaphors the district court thought were important to stress. It's, it couldn't quite explain what was wrong about doing this, but it described um, these transactions as odorous and unjustified. So um, after DOJ secured this uh, criminal conviction of AMP and, the, uh, and its executives tried to break the company up in a civil suit that languished for a few years during a change of administration in the mid-20th century DOJ. Ultimately, that case settled. Uh, AMP had to spin off the purchasing agent, but otherwise the company remained uh, solvent long enough for me to work for it as a bag boy in the 1980s. All right. I want to turn to a retrospective on this case that was published in the Yale Law Journal in 1949. That's a long time ago, 1949. Here are some of the quotes from this Yale Law Journal note. This is an economics professor um, uh, at Yale who's getting his law degree at the same time and later went on to teach elsewhere. Um, and I'm going to hold it as a mystery for a moment who it is. Um, here are some of the critiques he, he raised. Uh, court never draw, drew a clear line between predatory and competitive price cutting implied nonsensically that vertical integration was illegal per se, and no one ever made clear exactly you know, when vertical integration would be a problem. Um, the court's analysis also disregarded the dynamic nature of competition and the fact that competition is brutal and often puts companies out of business, but that's all in the interest of a competitive, uh, a competitive environment. And ultimately, the DOJ's decision to use the Sherman Act to go after AMP was um, an indication that there was a real contradiction in the way DOJ was using the antitrust laws. In other words, antitrust philosophy on display in the AMP case was a paradox, policy at war with itself. So who wrote this 1949 Yale note? And this is a trick question. It was not Robert Bork. It was not anybody else from the Chicago School. It was a very young Don Turner who ended up co-authoring the lead, leading treatise with Phil Arita in antitrust, and who also ended up being the antitrust chief in the Lyndon Johnson administration, which is not terribly known for its economic conservatism. This illustrates an important point, which is that the observations I just raised there about the need to distinguish between competitive and predatory price cuts, the need to understand the benefits of vertical integration, the need to understand that consumer-friendly competition often puts competitors out of business. Um, those, are, those are not new concepts that originated with Robert Bork or with the Chicago School in the 80s. These were well known to anyone who analyzed the antitrust law in mid-century from the perspective of economics. All right, I have, and um, Derek has kindly told me that I can go a few minutes over. I'm going to contrast um, Don Turner's note with a uh, recent, more recent note that appeared in the Yale Law Journal by Lena Kahn, who's a, um, a very bright rising star in antitrust circles and is uh, viewed pop properly as a uh, leading light of the, of the populist movement in antitrust. Um, I'm going to express severe disagreement <laughs> with her position on, on this set of issues. So Lena Kahn, in attacking internet giants, claims that we should dispense with the sort of Brook Group-oriented doctrinal distinction between competitive and predatory price cutting. And in, in particular, we should dispense with recruitment, recruitment requirements for what she calls large platform providers. Instead, we should look at you know, whether companies exploit their size, and we should look at the rich set of concerns that animated earlier critics of predation. Well, we looked at those rich set of concerns in the AMP case. And what we got instead of an analysis um, and a set of rules that companies know how to follow is rhetoric um, from a prosecutor. And my concern is that we're likely to see the same sort of rhetoric if we dispense with the uh, consumer welfare orientation of antitrust today. Um, in addition, um, 
Linacon takes issue with Amazon's creation of a logistics empire to reduce delivery times if you are able to get quick delivery from Amazon. Uh, it's in part because Amazon has built out a whole infrastructure of warehouse or, warehouses. But it doesn't hoard the scale economies of those warehouses to itself. It allows third-party merchants to avail themselves of those scale economies as, as well. And it actually reduces their costs. Um, the the uh, third-party merchants who participate in marketplace are able to uh, reduce their shipping costs uh, more than they would if they were trying to, if they sought to deal with UPS and FedEx directly. So what's the problem? The, the problem is, according to this note, uh, the conflicts of interest, tarnished neutrality. That to me, those are words that outside the con context of a fiduciary relationship um, aren't particularly persuasive. To me, the question is, is this the sort of behavior that makes consumers better off or worse off? over the long run, and I've never heard, I've heard Carl and others give expositions of the raising rivals cost theory of antitrust, never heard a clear exposition of how lowering rivals costs is a basis for antitrust liability or why it should be. And this reminds me also of the attack on AMP's own um, uh, purchasing agent, uh, the theory that there's just something unseemly about doing business with your rivals. Okay, so imagine that Congress enacted a more populist vision of antitrust, and your job, like mine, is to answer calls from clients asking, well, what should we do about particular practices that we're considering? So suppose that you get a call from Apple back 10 years ago that said, you know, we have this really neat new device called the iPod and an application called the iTunes Music Store. We liked it. We would like to launch it. Um, at a low price, but we're a little concerned that we're going to be so popular that we put Olson's books and records and other record stores out of business. In fact, they did. Should we launch it? Should we price the, the songs at a higher level that we view as profit maximizing because we want to cut Olson's books and record a break? Or what about Netflix? Netflix put Potomac Video out of business when it made use of more efficient distribution me mechanisms to compete with local video stores. Amazon had a way of keep people, if they didn't want to buy physical books anymore, didn't have to. They could buy Kindle, they could download books at a very low price onto the Kindle. That also is very bad for Olson's books and records, which, by the way, no longer exists, um, even though I liked it. And uh, yet all of these are practices that we, I think we celebrate as a com country because these are the source of disruptive economic developments that are extremely good for consumers and make America a global leader. So I'm going to skip right through this slide um, to go to one issue in particular that's been raised in some of the discussions, which is if we augment antitrust analysis beyond consumer welfare to look at other values. Well, one of those other values, should, among a constellation of others like labor rights and campaign finance reform, um, should be whether um, antitrust enforcers should look at the political implications of particular conduct or political deals. So Tim Wu, in the materials that we circulated before this conference, has an interesting article in which he says, you know, does the, the, the enforcer should look to, at whether the complaint of conduct or merger tend to implicate important non-economic values, particularly political values. So might it tend to preserve a long-standing politically influential oligopoly? These are not issues today that are recognized under antitrust. What could go wrong if we added these to the antitrust analysis? Well, a president could go wrong. <laughs> these are actual tweets or campaign statements by our nation's chief executive who views antitrust as a weapon to punish his political enemies and reward his political friends. He is very explicit about saying that he would block the NBC Comcast merger mainly because NBC is uh, liberal, but he would approve the Sinclair merger with Tribune because they are conservative and America needs more conservative voices. Now the question is, do we want that sort of analysis explicit or even implicit in antitrust law? The consumer welfare standard with its precise focus on standards <laughs> and economics insulates us from this sort of political influence. All right, I'm going to close now by noting that the first panel addressed really two quite distinct sets of issues which were often conflated, and I think Fiona pointed this out.
um, there are one set of issues is how can we improve antitrust to make consumers better off than the current enforcement environment does? So are there particular issues within antitrust, like how to assess error costs, when to use bright line rules versus the rule of reason, when should we deploy concentration presumptions or should we change them in the horizontal merger context? How should we think about vertical integration? We heard about that this morning. Um, when should we supplement antitrust with sector-specific regulation, like FCC rules about horizontal concentration in media industries? Those are all useful question, debates for us to have. They are all within the rubric of the consumer welfare standard. And the populist movement that we see today is helpful in that it, I think, helps us think of new perspectives on this set of issues. What is not helpful is a request to move antitrust beyond what I think these three principles are uh, in antitrust's current consensus, which is how do we use rigorous economic analysis to advance the interests of consumers in virtually all market settings, except for natural monopoly markets where you might want some degree of sector-specific regulation. Thank you. Carl, you're up. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Let's keep going here. Maybe shake a little bit, keep moving. I want to first thank Chairman Simons, really, for um, bringing in such a diverse set of voices into this debate. Um, I, I, I just think what we saw this afternoon was, was impressive in that respect. And as an academic, I might be tempted to kind of get into some of these arcane or philosophical or historical debates, but actually I'm a practitioner too, so I want to be very pragmatic. And the question is, how do we move forward to make antitrust more effective and stronger? And, and, and actually, we just heard, and we've heard on the earlier panel, let's distinguish making antitrust more effective and stronger on the one hand from what the standard should be. Now, they're related, but they're separate questions. Okay, now, I was asked, I guess this, the two of us here are supposed to be defending the consumer welfare standard, but I have a weird way of doing that, which is by proposing the protecting competition standard. Okay. Now, it's, and by the way, the, the little copyright here is a joke. Just to be clear, the, my point, and this, you'll see this for the next few minutes, is that the consumer welfare standard, I think, as, as somebody said earlier, maybe it was Tim Wu, has been tainted and misused, in my view, to, was it Fiona? She's looking at me, Fiona Scott Morton. Um, tainted and misused to shrink back antitrust enforcement and has become confusing. So I think that we should jettison that language, but basically work with the, with the fundamental idea. And that, that's what I'm doing here with being a little cute with the, with the trademark, which, which is a fake, which is a joke, but protecting competition standard. As I head into that, I want to align myself, since we've already heard quite a bit on this, I want to align myself quite closely, particularly with Gene Kimmelman and Fiona Scott Morton from the earlier conversations. And to a considerable extent, that surprises me actually, in some respects, with Tim Wu as well, although not as wholly with him. Okay, uh, I think the fundamental issue is that the case law has gotten out of whack using a, a kind of a, a improper notion of consumer welfare standard, what that means, and we need to fix that, but not to fundamentally change the standard we use um, in antitrust. Okay, so what do I mean by the protecting competition standard? And just just so it's clear with the subtitle here, this is what I'm, what I'm talking about here is in many ways what, what, what some people, including myself in the past, would call the consumer welfare standard, but in my view, done right and rebranded because it's tainted and confusing. Okay, so what do I mean by this? And this will echo my, my testimony in front of the Senate uh, subcommittee on antitrust last December. So I'm just gonna read it because uh, this is important to everything that follows. A business practice is judged to be anti-competitive if it, if it harms trading parties on the other side of the market as a result of disrupting the competitive process. And I want to put a lot of weight on disrupting the competitive process, okay, but that's a little bit unclear what that means and can be vague, so we really want to talk about harming the trading parties on the other side. Now, what are those trading parties? And by the way, John Sallet, I think earlier, had a very similar formulation and discussed some of these trading parties. So look, in the traditional cartel case, you've got gas stations colluding to raise the price of gas sold to motorists. That's consumers of the trading parties. We think about that, that's fine. But if we have jet fuel, if the suppliers of jet fuel are colluding to raise the price, well, the immediately injured parties are the airlines who buy the jet fuel. They're not consumers, 
Okay, and to call them consumers would be confusing. Okay, and nor should we have to ask, well, did the airlines pass it on the jet fuel increase to consumers in order to decide whether that price fixing was bad or some other conduct? No, no, we don't. So if you want, so you don't need to trace it to the final consumers. In that case, the trading parties are the customers in the traditional formulation we have. Um, same with, with horizontal merger, right? If the airlines merge, we have the passengers. We understand that. If railroads merge, maybe they charge more for, the, for their passengers, but maybe they charge more for the farmers to move their produce, obviously a, particularly a late 19th century concern. In that case, the, we would think of the railroads uh, as, as basically, or somebody, it's, it's really akin to a monopsony power, right? The farmers only have one way to get their product to market. Okay, so we want to look upstream as well, and we have the no poach cases involving the workers where, where the DOJ, you know, went after it. So it's very clear, I think, from the actual case law and the enforcement and economics that when we, the trading parties could be upstream or downstream, okay? Now, it's true the focus has been more downstream, and um, that doesn't need to stay the case, but to fix that doesn't mean changing the standard, it just means bringing the cases if workers are hurt, okay, or farmers are hurt. And um, so, so that, and, and so, so that's, we're, we're good on that, okay? Again, the, the consumer welfare language is confusing, but in terms of the underlying economics, as Fiona Scott Morton said, we understand monopsony, that's, that's fine. Okay, now, um, I think here is where we get, start to engage a little bit with some of the things on the previous panel. In my view, and what I'm putting forward, the goal of antitrust law and policy. As an economist, I don't like to talk about you know, what's the law or not, but I kind of stray into that, but the policy or the economic goals is to protect competition, okay? Now, when I say protecting competition, it means safeguarding the competitive process. Now, we have to unpack that. What does that mean, okay? Um, and I would say it means that we, if firms are competing in some, legitimately, we have to define that, we accept the results of that process, okay? Um, and if we think the outcome is not acceptable, there's a monopoly that's durable and we just can't live with, but that firm maybe got there through merits, then we need some sort of sector-specific regulation, okay? Now, this is not a Chicago school view. This is not a, have to do with the, I don't think it's not about the consumer welfare standard. I'm gonna take whatever it is, one minute of my time to read from what Judge Learned Hand said in the Alcoa case in the 40s, because I think it says it so well, and I just really don't think we want to depart from this. He said, a single producer may be the survivor out of a group of active competitors merely by virtue of his superior skill, foresight, and industry. In such cases, a strong argument can be made that although the result may expose the public to the evils of monopoly, the act, the Sherman Act he's referring to, does not mean to condemn the result of those forces which it is its prime ob object to foster. Finis opus coronat. You can figure that out the Latin. The successful competitor, having been urged to compete, must not be turned upon when he wins. And I think your A and P case, of course, is very much as you've described it along those lines. Okay. So I really don't think it's a good idea. I think there'd be very limited support for the idea of abandoning that principle. Okay. Now I think what you're hearing from uh, Maurice Stuckey, for example, with he the, his lead bullet there was preservation of competitive market structures. Okay, now if you have a single firm that gets big and gains a lot of share, maybe a monopoly position through this process without any question that they do it legitimately, you would not have a competitive market structure as you measured market shares. So that is a, that is a departure, that's a significant difference. I don't think we wanna go there, but that's one of the issues potentially on the table. I think we wanna live with the results of competition and then of course enforce the anti-laws laws vigorously against, uh, to, to constrain such a monopolist, but not to break them up just because the market structure uh, looks um, concentrated or is concentrated. Okay, now when we follow this approach, the structuring of the inquiry, we asked, so I said, whether, the, whether trading partners have been harmed as a result of, of conduct that disrupts the competitive process. So we're thinking about the trading parties. We're, we're not particularly concerned, per se, if the competitors are injured, and that's become a mantra. And we're not saying there's anything wrong with being big, okay? Now, if you don't agree with that, then you're in a different space. Then you're not protecting competition. You're doing some other social policy. I don't think that should be antitrust role, but that's one of the things potentially to be the debate. I think this co gives coherence to what we're talking about. 
And how, how would I illustrate that? So let's just, let's just go through a few examples. And I think, by the way, the way we all want to move this debate forward, and I certainly hope the FTC, as they take all of us on board, is instead of talking about disruptive, competitive process, let's, do, let's talk about specific fact patterns to see where there's a difference between what the different people are saying. So take horizontal price fixing. OK, that disrupts the competitive process. They raise price. They're not competing. That harms the customers. Clear. What about standard setting? It's an agreement among competitors. They agree to, only, to produce products that meet a certain standard. People who produce non-compliant products, it's not going to be commercially attractive. It reduces choice. How do we choose between those two? I mean, why is, why is standard setting not per se illegal? Right? It's an agreement. has all these other features. It sounds like it disrupts the competitive process. They don't compete with all these incompatible products. Well, how do we tell? We say, well, we actually think, in most cases, the standard setting leads to consumer benefits, a larger market, lower prices, you know, other benefits of compatibility. So that's how we tell. Okay, we, we, we tell by looking at how does it affect the trading parties, not through just the, some notion of the process. Likewise, for horizontal mergers, we don't think just because two firms that are competitors merge and they, yeah, they, they don't compete anymore, the market's more concentrated, but we don't say that's per se illegal because we understand there may be some efficiencies associated with that. How do we judge? Well, we ultimately look at the effect on the, usually on the consumers, on the customers in any event, for the normal downstream posture. And likewise, for predatory pricing, as has been explained, we need a boundary between what's legitimate price competition that we welcome and some sort of predatory or exclusionary price fixing. Now, the courts have come up with a standard through Brook Group, and it involves below cost and recoupment. I tend to think that recoupment piece is overstated, and, and I think that could be worked on, probably should be worked on. But the notion that we need a boundary, and ultimately it's really about, do we think this is going to harm the customers? You know, from ultimately high prices later or less innovation, or not? And I don't, I don't really want to not do that step. Okay, otherwise I don't know how I'm going to have a boundary between legitimate pricing and not. The Microsoft case we heard about is a, is a very good case. There was discussion about it earlier. Again, the reason we, we evaluate that based on do we think that was going to reduce innovation. Believe me, that's not about price effects. It's never really about price effects. And you couldn't do price effects for some product that wasn't going to be out there for a few years. So, but it came out in a good way. Okay, all right. So, so I think you, this trading parties and disrupting the competitive process, both of those pieces are needed with whatever you call the standard. I'm calling that the protecting competition standard. Okay, so let's then compare that with some of the attacks on the consumer welfare standard, um, which we've just heard, okay? Um, and again, I want to, particularly Tim, who I th saw it very eloquently, Look, the, the way the courts and cases have evolved over the last 20, 30, 40 years has shrunken antitrust enforcement, and it's a problem. We, and Fiona Scott Morton said we have, a more, we, have large, we have more issues about market power. I agree with both of those statements, but I do not think it means we need to abandon this mode of analysis. In fact, I think we should not. So what are the criticisms? First, some of them are based on misconceptions. It's not, the Consumer Welfare Center is not just about price or short run and doesn't ignore the suppliers. We have the no-poach cases and so the case law. It's just, it's just a misconception. Now, there's a reason that misconception has taken root, because the word consumer welfare standard sounds like it's about consumers. It gets people confused. That's why I think we need to change the, the language, OK? You can't expect the, people, the, 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 the community at large to know that, it's a, that, it's, that somehow when you say consumer welfare, you include the workers who didn't have a, ch a good chance to shop or to, to get to, for competition uh, for, for employment opportunities. It sure doesn't sound like it handles that. Why would we think people should know that? So there's a real problem there with, with the, the, you know, just the words and the branding, if you will. Some criticisms, most of the criticisms actually, relate to excessive burdens of proof on plaintiffs. So you know, in every area, um, and a lot of what Maurice Stuckey is putting forward with, with some proposed legislative changes, I think basically all of those, or almost all of those, the ones that anyhow work for me, are their excessive burdens on the, the plaintiffs. Look, you cannot, and if, if it means the economists are coming into court and have to prove the measure of these price effects and sometimes in the future or new products, that's very hard. Believe me, I've been cross-examined on those things. You can't, we don't, we're not able to do that a lot of the time, okay? So if inability to do that means the plaintiff loses, we're not in a good, we're not in the right place, okay? So, so um, we can do a lot with shifting the burdens of proof and the presumptions, I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. So that's a legitimate, I think, a very important concern about the evolution of the case law, but it's not about the standard, okay? Take the standard, 
rebrand it, give it a name that people understand, and tighten things up. Now, whether the current courts are going to do that, I'm not so confident, but that's what hopefully the FTC, based on these hearings, can help push us in that direction. Okay. All right. Now, and I, so this is, um, so, okay, the same point in a different way. Um, even if, look, I think most, I think most people who are informed would say that antitrust was not in good balance in the 60s, okay? The economics was not that sound, and, and there was a bunch of cases that, and a and in the 50s, I guess, as well. So there were needed corrections, and it's true, it came around the same time, some of it, as this upsurgence of the consumer welfare standard. But, um, and I think the court's overshot, like I've said, but to fix that, we should, uh, we should fix that with, you know, with, through, through the approaches I've described, not by throwing out the standard and doing something either vague or that doesn't have the elements I've described, which is disrupting the competitive process, harming trading parties. Also, economics, some people who are attacking the consumer's welfare standard basically, well, it's a plot by the, these economists love to measure things and they, it's kind of these, these, these experts who miss the point. Look, economics is just a tool. And if anybody thinks you can do antitrust with econom without economics, come talk to me later. Okay. okay. So, um, all right, so what does it mean going forward? Um, I think uh, there's a lot of work in economics going on right now, the last couple of years, and I'm sure the next several years, in my field, industrial organization economics, in, academ in academics, researchers, and elsewhere, that is indeed showing, I would say, generally, that larger companies have a bigger share of the economy. Uh, firm size has gone up. A bunch of markets have become more concentrated. It's hard to measure that systematically, but that seems to be the case. Some very efficient superstar firms, they're called in some of the literature, are taking share from other firms. They're becoming geographically broader. Globalization is part of this. That is a process that has been going on for some time and probably will continue unless it's stopped through some public policies. So what does that mean? Does that mean that antitrust has failed us? No, I don't think so. A lot of that, and Amazon's a good example, sure looks to be the competitive process at work. Not all of it, you have to look case by case, but a lot of those trends are broad and they reflect scale economies, information technology. And one of the things that the, the industrial organization economists have learned in the last 10 or 15 years that many of you may not know is there's just tremendous evidence that in a given industry, there's enormous variation in the efficiency of the firms, okay? So if you have this model about, oh, all the firms compete and it's Darwinian and they all end up, you know, it roughly comparable, that is not what happens in the real world. You get enormous variation and that persists. And the, large, the more efficient firms tend to get bigger and that's just an ongoing process. So that process means when we get some markets that are more concentrated through that competitive process, we're going to also be getting, that is, that is in fact, benefiting consumers, and it's, we want to encourage it, actually. Okay, although it's tough on the people who are, on the firms who are less efficient, to be sure. So all that's happening. That means we need antitrust more. Okay, the fact is, it means there's more market power in the economy. That's what the evidence is showing. Higher margins, we can we debate about how to measure that. Um, more concentrated markets. Entry barriers can be very difficult. If you're trying to enter a market where there are three or four big players who've been in there for a long time and they're very efficient, that's pretty tough. You're small, you haven't done it, that's tough, okay? So the, the notion that entry barriers are somehow generally low, I don't think that's, that's a valid assumption. So, so we need antitrust more, okay? Um, but that doesn't mean we need a new standard. It means we need antitrust more. So how should we do that? So, of course, I'm suggesting the protecting competition standard. And again, it, it, it's, it's the consumer's, consumer welfare standard done right with a better name. And I think the FTC can play a big role in this, okay? And I hope that that's the lesson they will take from these hearings is that we need antitrust more. The, an, an overly narrow reading of consumer welfare and excessive burdens on plaintiffs have shrunken antitrust in a way that's not been helpful for consumers or other, other parties who are, who, are the, who are suffering from market power on the other side of the market. Um, in horizontal mergers, we can do this by making sure we keep and strengthen the Philadelphia National Bank structural presumption, well, and plus a few other things. Merger, it's, it's a predictive exercise. If the consumer welfare standard is supposed to mean that you have to go in and precisely predict exactly what the price effects will be, well, that's not going to be very good for effective enforcement, but that's not what the standard should mean. 
standard should mean you're looking at is it likely that there will be harm to competition and the customers in the normal case will be hurt. Is it likely, based on the best you can tell? Maybe it'll be fewer products offered. Maybe it'll be higher prices. Maybe it'll be something else. Maybe it'll be less privacy protection for, I don't know, whatever it is. So you, don't, you can't predict things precisely. We can use some other metrics to, to gauge things, not just herfinols. And I think we should be very, quite demanding on an entry defense because a lot of markets entry is not, not easy and we shouldn't just think it is. Okay, so that should be really a burden on the, on the, uh, the defense, unless it's very clear, uh, to show that entry's easy, okay? And we've had that debate for a while. I think we need to move things in that direction. That's all within the consumer welfare or protecting competition standard. Exclusionary conduct, uh, again, the courts, you know, have trimmed it back so much. These pay-for-delay cases should not be so hard, okay? The economics is not that complicated. So something's gone wrong that it's been 20 years and it's still working its way through and the courts are struggling with it. And, you know, I've talked to a number of federal judges about this, and it's hard, you know, the agencies need to help them, the economists need to help them, uh, but it's not about a different standard. And we could do, Tim really talk about how to, what to do for exclusive dealing. Okay, so, so I think that's, that's really, um, that's what I'm encouraging the, the FTC to take away from this session and these hearings today at least, this afternoon at least, that don't blow up what we've learned, including the A&P case, including a lot of other things. Don't blow that up, build on that, and do more because we need to do more now, but use the protecting competition standard. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. I'd like to invite the other panelists to uh, come up to the stage. <clears throat> um, three of our uh, panelists are veterans from the prior panel. Um, Fiona Scott Morton, Maurice Stuckey, and Barry Lynn, uh, so I won't introduce them. Uh, our final panelist is uh, Jeff Manny, who uh, has the same job as Barry, but for a different organization. He is the founder and executive director of the International Center for uh, Law and Economics. And uh, each uh, panelist, uh, each uh, discussant, has uh, five minutes to respond to the opening presentations and we'll go in order, the order in which they're sitting um, on the table, and we'll start with Barry. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm gonna mainly, well, first I'll, I'll start off by um, saying I greatly appreciated uh, Carl's presentation. It's really good to see uh, Carl moving towards uh, Tim and Jean. Uh, I, you know, I, I'd say it's important that we, um, uh, this, the idea that Carl is uh, moving towards is actually uh, setting aside the consumer, uh, the term consumer is, uh, as I made clear in my own presentation, I believe that's a, uh, a fundamental, uh, a fundamental importance just so that we actually begin to get back to understanding the prime purpose of what our anti-monopoly laws were created for. Um, I'm going to just focus, I'm, uh, what I'm mainly going to do is focus, um, so actually I, what I want to say with, with Carl is I think that there's a lot of opportunity for us to continue this conversation and, and move towards getting to uh, a real understanding. Um, with John, I actually have a number of questions for John, a whole, you know. Um, in your presentation, you said that consumers benefited, and I would just say, like, for how long would they benefit from this system in which you have this really massive uh, single um, uh, retailer sort of controlling thing? You know, did they benefit on price? Um, did they benefit in, uh, in terms of qual quality? Did they benefit in terms of variety? You know, are we talking about the, the physical, uh, physical goods that are sold in this store? Are we talking about the retail services? Um, you know, I mean, what is the effect on suppliers of this kind of consolidation? You know, what is this, you know, obviously we know what the effect is on horizontal competitors. Um, you know, but, you know, there's a lot of evidence, after all, that monotony drives consolidation among suppliers. I mean, we saw this with the P&G and Gillette merger. You know, is that a good thing? Uh, you know, when you when, with the A and P, when when the A and P drove that kind of consolidation, is that a good thing? Uh, you know, it's a question that we have to answer. Um, you, you know, you say that A and P created customer value by studying how people like their butter. You know, innovation. Are you saying that in, independent grocers were not able to do the same thing? Um, 
you said that the AM, uh, the AMP cut out the middleman. Are you saying that AMP is not, as a retailer, simply another middleman, just bigger and more powerful? Uh, speaking of middlemen, you mentioned how AMP is vertically integrated. Um, we had a lot of conversations earlier about vertical integration. Uh, do you see a difference between when, say, Jill's Grocery vertically integrates into selling jam at the corner of Pine Street and Main Street, and when Amazon vertically integrates into publishing, say, books, when it controls 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 percent of the market for different lines of business and the book and uh, uh, book selling? Uh, you know, you made a bunch of comments on predatory pricing. Uh, are you saying that uh, you a large retailer that engages in predatory pricing cannot recoup its losses after knocking out its rivals? Are you saying that Wall Street does not routinely, in the periods when it is illegal, provide capital to certain corporations specifically to undersell, bankrupt, and replace their rivals? You know, I mean, J.P. Morgan did this with the AT&T. Bain Capital did this with Staples. Are you saying that foreign mercantile estates, China, Brazil, don't sometimes provide capital to certain industries precisely to undersell their rivals in ways that uh, uh, drive out American businesses, American manufacturers? You know, uh, uh, did you know that sort of uh, the Anheuser-Busch InBev, Heinz, Kraft, Pilgrim's Pride, Swift are all owned, all run by a set of, uh, uh, of like capitalists that <clears throat> received funding from the Brazilian state to uh, expand and to bankrupt their rivals? Um, you say that consolidation, such as by a and the, we, what we saw by ANP, leads to lower prices. Is that always true? Are you saying that you don't believe in the, that Smithian systems of competition work? Um, do you know where your thoughts originated? You mentioned Don Turner in 1949. You know, I, I would actually turn everybody. I think everyone should go study Bill Kovacic's uh, paper from a few years back on the double helix of modern antitrust. Yes. <clears throat> Turner and Arita and Breyer and Alfred Kahn agreed with the Chicago schoolers in many fundamental ways. But, and this is really key, it's really important for the folks in this uh, uh, community to understand it. Where did Turner and Arita and Breyer and Alfred Kahn get a lot of their basic thinking? It came from John Kenneth Galbraith, who was a command and control socialist who relied on Thorsten Veblen for his intellectual guidance. Thorsten Veblen, as some of you know, relied on, it was a representative of the new nationalism of Teddy Roosevelt at the time when Teddy Roosevelt was promoting corporatism, <clears throat> even a sort of fascism. Can you describe the ultimate outcome of your vision of competition? Where does, when you just let the AMP system continue on and on, unstopped, where does that go? Where does the Walmart system go if you don't stop it? Where does the Amazon system lead? Do we really just want one corporation selling everything? I mean, didn't the Soviet Union try that? And it didn't work all that well? Uh, I mean, I have some others, but I think that's sufficient. So we're going to let all of the panelists uh, give their five-minute presentations, and then Carl and John will uh, will have a, 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 a chance to respond. Uh, Barry did most of my job for me by posing a number of questions for, for John. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll move on to Maurice. All right, well, thank you. So, so far we've been talking, you know, how effective has the consumer welfare standard been in the past 35 years? And while that's interesting, and, you know, we have evidence suggest that it may not have been as successful as some have claimed. The real issue is where are we going forward in a data-driven economy? And here what I see is a growing divide between the EU, Australia, and other jurisdictions in the US. And there's a greater concern over these giant tech platforms, dataopolis, and the risks that they impose. Now, if you look at it strictly from a consumer welfare standard, they may not necessarily be that bad because price is going down, quality because of network effects are going up. And you might think, well, that's a good thing. But what the market inquiries that the Europeans are undertaking is that there's, there are potential risks. Well, and the ACCC, for example, is doing a platform inquiry on the power of these platforms. And so 
three um, points here that are relevant. First, when companies, when these data dataopolies vertically integrate, their incentives can change, and they have various tools that can then make it harder for rivals to compete. So that's why the European Commission is now looking at Amazon in a preliminary <coughs> inquiry on its use of data to thwart rivals. Second, we hear about, oh, if you open up the boogeyman, you know, like political issues and whatever. Antitrust has always had political component. I mean, it was always the concern about how economic power can translate into political power. And the issue with these data dataopolies is now is that they even pose even greater concerns than some of the monopolies in the past because of the way they interact with consumers, their gatekeeper function, and the like. And then the third is, you know, no-fault monopolies. No, we're not arguing no-fault monopolies. And impact on trading parties, that's a st step in the right direction. Thank you. But <laughs> I would still then ask, Carl, how would you then handle Clores? How would you handle then when a powerful firm acquires a nascent competitive threat? How would you deal with sort of exclusionary practices where you can't necessarily determine what impact is going to have, let's say, on something that's quantifiable? And so, you know, in our book, uh, Big Data Competition Policy, we point out Google Ways and the struggle that the predecessor to the CMA had in trying to identify how is Google's acquisition of Waze likely to harm consumers. And that's very difficult. And it used to be that Alcoa and Rome, that you didn't have to show that. You can show that there was an effect. Now, Carl raises a fair point. What if the market naturally tends towards a monopoly on the, the goodness of the heart of the monopolist? Yeah, that might be a problem. And then the other point I think that's key here, and I, I, I don't want anyone to confuse it, is we never argue that antitrust is the elixir. What we argue in the data-driven economy, you need greater coordination among the competition officials, the privacy officials, the consumer protection officials, and you need greater coordination among the jurisdictions. So I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, Maurice. Uh, Jeff, it's your turn. Thanks, Derek. And uh, thanks to the FTC for having me. <laughs> um, so uh, I thought I would just start by, by um, adding to the many quotes from Brandeis that we've already heard. Um, uh, I can't really have too many Brandeis quotes. Um, th this one goes uh, something along the lines of um, c consumers are, uh, quote, servile, self-indulgent, indolent, and ignorant. Um, and as we did already hear, actually, um, uh, Brandeis also was no fan of low prices. Uh, in fact, he thought they were pernicious. Um, my point in mentioning these uh, is just to draw attention to the problems of <clears throat> expanding the conception of the consumer welfare standard or of the purpose of antitrust uh, when you may not like where the expansion takes you. Um, it, even the, the standard bearer of, of this process is someone who absolutely had ideas that I think most of us would, uh, would, would disagree strenuously with. Um, I think it's interesting, I think someone mentioned this before, that, that we're talking about the, the consumer welfare standard. Um, I don't think we're really talking about the consumer welfare standard. Um, I think that for uh, at least two reasons. I'll start with two, I'll probably come up with some more. Um, the, the first reason is um, that I think what we're really talking about here um, and, and Maurice's comments just uh, just brought this home to me, uh, is whether we start with a presumption, um, we start with the basic presumption of antitrust as one that is inhospitable to ununderstood business practices or one that is relatively inhospitable to their condemnation. Uh, we're, we're, that's fundamentally what we're talking about here. We're, we are talking about um, the future of data and large platforms and where it leads us, the sense, the feeling that there is something wrong, and the question whether we should greet the, these relatively new structures, um, the consequences of which we don't perfectly understand, with um, relative skepticism or relative approval unless and until it's demonstrated that there's actually something problematic there. This is not the consumer welfare standard. Not either of those views is consistent with the consumer welfare standard, but I think that's actually what we're talking about. We're actually talking about, um, and this gets us to the, the second 
reason that we're not really talking about the consumer welfare standard. Um, we are, in fact, talking about the achievement of social and political objectives, um, mostly that are focused on restraints on business conduct that proponents haven't been able to achieve and fear they can't achieve through direct legislative means. Um, I learned from the last panel that this is actually a discussion about the structure of our government. Um, uh, I learned that antitrust judges are fools, that we should do antitrust by plebiscite, or maybe we should do it by locking experts in a room um, and having them come up with the right answers. Um, I also learned that political influence seems to only go one direction. Um, all of that could possibly be true, but I don't really understand what it has to do with antitrust or the consumer welfare standard. The stated aim, preserving competition, protecting competition, promoting competition, however you, you um, define it, is perfectly commensurate with the consumer welfare standard. Carl is exactly right about this. Um, there is nothing, yeah, <laughs> I've said that actually before, but, but uh, you know, glad to get to say Thank it again. You. Um, uh, I, there's nothing in the consumer welfare standard uh, that says you can't fiddle with the specific levers, the specific doctrines uh, by which cases are decided. Um, uh, and in fact, this would be my third reason why we're not really talking about the consumer welfare standard, is because the consumer welfare standard isn't operable. What matters, and, and I think, Carl, you, you essentially said this, is um, the presumptions, the burden shifting, uh, the standards of proof, the, the, the actual process by which we decide antitrust cases. Um, those are the mechanisms by which any of this will actually change, if it changes at all, and those are the conversations that we should be having. Now, my, my problem with the, the presumption uh, coming in from um, from Barry and, and Maurice, um, uh, and actually also Carl, is um, that uh, usually, before we move from a status quo to a new position, especially one that effectively oppose, imposes ex-ante remedies, right? Um, let's take, this isn't, I don't mean to tar Carl with this, but let's say you start with a sort of structural approach, that basically, um, uh, in particular one that says, even more obviously, let's break up some existing uh, companies because they've exceeded whatever threshold we decide. You're imposing a remedy, and usually we require proof before you impose a remedy. Proof of a harm and proof of a connection between the remedy um, and the harm that it will actually solve the harm. Um, we have some evidence in this regard. We've talked about it a little bit. Everyone's probably familiar with the papers that are out there. No doubt there will be more. Um, it is impossible to say that any of them have demonstrated all of the things that you need to demonstrate to, to make a, a transformation of antitrust, which means the increase in concentration that people have pointed to. It's not so clear that that actually has happened. That it is a costly one, that it is a problematic one, not one that is uh, being caused by increases in efficiency or scale uh, effects and the like. That it is caused by some defect in not just the, the manner in, or sorry, the amount of enforcement, of antitrust enforcement, but also these mechanisms that we've been using to do it. Um, and that indeed changing it in these particular ways, um, especially the, the ones that would impose structural and other presumptions ex ante, would, would solve the purported problems. None of that has actually been demonstrated. We have a little bit of evidence to suggest something we should look at, and that's why, as others have said, I will second that this process is great. I'm delighted that the FTC is doing this, and I think we should continue to, to do this and talk about it, but I think we need a lot more proof before we actually impose that kind of a remedy. Uh, Fiona. So thank you for the invitation to be on this panel uh, and the previous one. I'll start with an apology. Uh, on the first day of these hearings, the one that did happen despite the hurricane, uh, Jason Furman left in the middle of his panel uh, for another meritorious engagement, and I'm afraid I have to do the same thing uh, today. So I have Derek's permission for that. I apologize in advance when I get up and leave. It's not because of what somebody's saying. Um, I wanted to comment on Carl's protecting competition <coughs> standard, which I think is really terrific. I also teach in a business school, and we have a marketing department. It turns out people hire those students. And uh, so we can rebrand, and if we're trying to convince both the public and the judiciary that something has changed, I think the renaming is critical. I um, think the emphasis on trading parties is more comprehensive, it's more clear. I think that the as a result portion of Carl's standard protects competition. 
and not competitors who are exiting or having trouble for some other reason. I think uh, disrupting the competitive process is again goes back to this idea of proof and burden. Does the plaintiff have to have precision about anti-competitive effects that are going to occur in an unseen but for world, a world that doesn't happen because the competitors excluded, a world that doesn't happen because the merger has not yet occurred. And I think Jeff's point uh, just a second ago was exactly uh, a demonstration of why we need this. That is to say, if you're going to tell me we don't have enough proof and you've got to articulate exactly all the reasons that the economy is going to go to hell in a handbasket if we don't change this standard before we change it, that's exactly the kind of high burden that stops us from acting appropriately and balancing the error cost of what do we know about the harms uh, from under-enforcement compared to the harms from over-enforcement. Um, turning to Carl's standard and, and how it relates to what Morris had said, let me note that in contrast to what Jeff just remarked, Carl said nothing about market structure. Or rather, he said, you take the market structure you get from the competitive process. I took okay. Him out of that. I said and that. that's. I oh, I see. That. Okay. You yeah. omitted. Excuse okay. me, I misheard. Jeff omitted Carl from that point, which is correct. Okay. So uh, we take the result we get from competition and the competitive process, but. We need to keep up the enforcement pressure on that entity regardless. So for example, let's imagine that Amazon obtained the market power and the market share that it has through the competitive process, and I'm certainly an enthusiastic customer. Does Amazon now get a free pass under the antitrust laws because they acquired that market share on the merits? No, of course. We keep up the enforcement pressure. And indeed, as Carl pointed out, when we have concentrated markets, this is even more necessary than usual because there isn't another competitor there who's strong to be keeping up the competitive pressure. So that means we need to be doing much more on potential competition theories, on exclusionary conduct as disrupting the competitive process, keeping a competitor out of the market, on facilitating practices uh, that might be enabling coordinated effects in the market because we're not having as many competitors as we otherwise would and in general on protecting small players, perhaps with data portability, perhaps with other kinds of techniques, but also with antitrust enforcement, because those small players are the only thing that stands between the consumer and, let's say, a monopolist or a very concentrated market structure, because somebody has grown. As Carl said, uh, we have more IT, we have more globalization, the, the efficient size of a firm looks like it's getting bigger. And that's good for consumers provided that that large firm continues to feel the heat of competitive pressure and performs to benefit consumers. So I think uh, this is exactly the right way to go. Uh, Rebrand, rename, be more clear, change presumptions and burdens to make it clear that the plaintiff does not have to specify all sorts of but for uh, specifics. and. Uh, shift the whole system, tighten it up and shift it so that we're getting a little bit more enforcement and that uh, protects us both in terms of mistakes we, we now understand that we've been making for the last 10 or 20 years, but also to create a level of competitive pressure that helps the consumer in the inevitable situation of more concentrated markets which are due to forces outside our control, exogenous forces having to do with technological change and globalization and so on. Uh, so that's, uh, that's I think, the, the really the sensible middle ground here. Uh, thank you, Fiona. Uh, we are now beginning the Q&A portion of the panel. I'd like to, uh, that's going to be question number one. I'd, <laughs> I'd like to uh, remind everyone in the audience uh, that my colleagues will be passing out note cards. If you write your question down on a note card, it will be passed up to me, and uh, I will ask the question uh, if there is time. Um, one way I'd like to differentiate this panel from the prior panel is I'd like to get a little bit more specific and, uh, and, and think about how the various uh, legal standards might apply to uh, specific examples. But first, uh, I'd like to give um, John first and then Carl an opportunity to respond to some of the comments and questions that were posted to them. Sure. A, a couple things. One is I'm also a fan of uh, Carl's rebranding. Um, consumer welfare standard has always been sort of an awkward shorthand to describe a standard that uh, embraces a variety of other things, but um, ultimately in any given case there is a standard rather than uh, competing um, values and unclear objectives. And I think 
Carl and I are on the same page with respect to that. I want to say a quick word about burden shifting in the modern world. I think we're overlooking that there are some pro-plaintiff burden shifting mechanisms already in place. So I'm going to take Microsoft and McWane as examples of Section 2 cases where once the government shows anti-competitive conduct by a monopolist, then the burden actually shifts to the monopolist to prove that the but-for world wouldn't have been any better anyway. The government doesn't actually have to prove anything about the but-for world in that context. We can talk a little bit more later about uh, burden shifting in HHIs, but HHIs are another context. Uh, we may very well believe that the line is drawn in the wrong place right now for horizontal mergers, but that's another context in which you do have effective burden shifting that favors uh, plaintiffs. Okay. Um, Barry asked a variety of questions about the a and case. I'm happy to field them uh, very briefly. His various questions actually reminded me a little bit of the sort of questions that I would get from Stephen Breyer when I would argue in the Supreme Court. They came in, they, I think it was like a seven-part question. Um, and I was always a little concerned that I wasn't going to get to all of them. And I may not get to all of them here, but he'll remind me if I don't. Um, and that, by the way, is I think the only thing that Barry that uh, has in common with Stephen Breyer. Stephen Breyer, of course, is the author of the Barry Wright predatory pricing case, which, uh, pre which previewed essentially what ended up being the Brook Group decision uh, by the Supreme Court. Okay, one is, did consumers benefit from uh, AMP's activities? Yeah, they, they paid much lower prices and they got access to stores with an enormous variety of produce and other grocery goods in them. Um, it, who, and did they did they sustain those benefits for a long time? Yeah, they sure did. AMP was in business when I was in high school, and um, they continued to sell prices, uh, the goods at very low prices. There was never a period in which AMP disserved consumers by excluding competition and then jacking up its rates. There are no consumer victims in the AMP story. There are wholesaler victims. Um, uh, Barry points out that, well, AMP was kind of a wholesale purchaser. Sure, it was. It bought directly from suppliers, but that ended up benefiting consumers as well because in the process it eliminated the double marginalization. It was able to undersell um, retail stores that were dependent on intermediaries who were profit-taking, uh, and the result, again, was that consumers were better off. Um, Barry asks, well, what, you know, this whole AMP system, where does it go? If we allow companies like AMP to prosper, don't we just end up with natural monopolies in all these industries? No, not, not really. I can, as someone who worked for a struggling AMP story in the 80s can tell you, there's a lot of competition for groceries out there. Kroger uh, cropped up and it's now the number two <coughs> retailer today after Walmart. Um, Safeway's out there, Giant's out there. All these companies were selling groceries at very, very, very low prices, and there was never anything that could remotely be called a recoupment period. Um, finally, Barry asked about what I, oh, Barry asked, what do, do I think the vertical integration is different in kind if it's undertaken by a dominant company? Well, let's think about Netflix, for example. Netflix is a dominant provider of streaming video services in this country. It's recently vertically integrated into um, video content production. I don't know anyone who thinks that's a bad thing, even though Netflix obviously has market power in the streaming video market. Um, finally, Barry asked whether I'm okay with foreign states like Brazil um, driving rivals out by uh, subsidizing products that are exported to the United States. I'm really against that, actually, and part of the reason is that's not competition. That's the government using its coercive authority to um, extract taxes from its own citizens so as to uh, drive out market-based companies not on the merits. Carl. Thanks. Uh, let me first respond to some things that Maurice said. Um, I think we are on, we're in agreement that we, we should be realistic about and think about how antitrust fits in with a range of other <coughs> policies, um, such as issues having to do with data security, data privacy, um, consumer protection, et cetera. Um, so, you know, obviously that brings in something like Facebook. From what everything I know, Facebook seems like they've, they've, they've had many serious missteps, but I haven't heard any clear antitrust element. Maybe there's a case I haven't heard of. Okay, I'm not saying. But the point is, 
we shouldn't be expecting NHS to do all those things. We should be looking to, regula to sector specific regulations. Gene Kimmelman emphasized this point. I kind of doubt the current FCC or FTC, maybe they need, I don't know whether they have the statutory authorities, you know, probably not in some of these areas, and maybe that is a place we can look to Europe. But that, that to me, is not about the competitive process and antitrust, it's about other areas where we need to have regulations to control some of these companies that are having such a powerful impact on our society um, and, and our citizens. Okay, so that's the first point. I think we mostly agree. Second, you raised a point, Maurice, about nation competitive threats, and it's hard to, to tell what's going to happen in those cases. I couldn't agree more. I think it's, and there's a separate uh, hearing the FTC is holding on, on some of those issues. I think it's a very hard area to know exactly what to do, but I certainly, I guess I'm generally quite open at this moment to saying if the FTC, DOJ, hopefully the courts then, would widen the aperture in terms of how we think about potential competition cases. Okay, particularly if it's a dominant firm and, a com and the acquired firm is a possible, maybe likely, adjacent, could become a threat in the future. You know, I, I, I can't don't want to totally formulate that now in, in two minutes, but um, that can be handled. And, then, and it seems like the Clayton Act's incipiency standard is probably some running room for that, serious running room. <coughs> I see no reason to change the standard we're using. I mean, why wouldn't the protecting competition standard work fine for that? That's a completely separate issue about how do we handle those cases where it's going to be hard to know what's going to happen. And that relates to some of Jeff's point, too. So those are the two main things. Oh, the, the side point. You mentioned the firm that gains a dominant position. I think you said through the goodness of their heart. That really wasn't what I was counting on, actually. I was thinking about um, pure selfish uh, pursuit of profits, um, which is why we need to control these, <laughs> these forces. OK, and then, um, Jeff, I want to respond to some of the things you said. Um, I agree that, that, uh, there, that an, a, good way, a good question to ask is, how do we react to novel business strategies? which often are brought about by changing technology and business forms, okay? I think it's true that there was a time 50 years ago uh, where there was a tendency to be hostile towards them, okay, of, of antitrust authorities or courts. Like, well, we haven't seen this before. It looks suspicious. I think that time's long past. Um, and, you know, I did work, uh, a lot of work on network effects and, and, and understanding, you know, how that works. Work goes back 30 years now. And so, no, that was not, it was recognized the importance of those, and it's a form of scale economy. It's not, not inhospitable to them, or things companies might do to foster interoperability or, or grow networks. So I just don't think that is um, it's something to be aware of, to sure, but I don't think it's driving things now and leading to, you know, false positives uh, false positive and antitrust enforcement. I wasn't talking about the status quo. I was talking about the, the, the movement away from the status Oh, yeah, I see. Okay, so then maybe we're, thanks, that's a helpful clarification. So I think we need to continue to be, I guess I would say, open and fairly neutral regarding a new, a new practice, but apply the approach that I've described and not think because it's new it's bad or because it's new and necessarily good, but we need to understand it. So maybe we're just in agreement on that, maybe. Thank you. Um, the other thing, uh, and this is my last point, um, Jeff, you said if we're going to um, I don't know quite how you put it. We're going to need a lot more proof to make certain changes. And since I'm not advocating throwing out the basic standard, but I am suggesting we tighten things up, I would turn that around on you, actually, and put it this way. Over the past 30, 40 years, 20, 30, 40 years, we've had, I think by all who follow this would agree, a substantial shrinking of, of the cases the plaintiffs can win, additional burdens and all that we've talked about. The Supreme Court has led that, uh, primarily in, in Sermon Act cases. But, and we've also s certainly had a reduction in, in merger enforcement from 1968 to you know, today. Okay. That's been a very substantial change. A lot of that has come without an empirical basis. Okay. A lot of that the courts have just decided they want to do things, and they've done it. So I would turn that around and say, wait a moment. We had all this shift without a lot of proof. And so maybe we should back up a little bit, back to where we were. Not, although I don't want to go back to 1968, don't get me wrong. Well, not in the guidelines, in some other cases. In some other respects, it was a good year. Actually, it was a very bad year in most respects. Um, music was good. Um, music, thank you. Um, so, uh, so no, I think the problem is that the, the 
shrinking of antitrust has occurred without an empirical basis and proof, and that's part of the problem. Okay, thank you. Um, now, uh, move on to more specific questions, and I'd like to um, start with uh, Carl's helpful framing about some uh, what he calls misconceptions with respect to the consumer welfare standard as uh, renamed by Carl. Um, so one of the misconceptions that Carl identifies is the idea that the standard, however named, uh, ignores harms to suppliers. So uh, let's think about a pure merger to monopsony uh, that affects um, a labor market and there are no plausible effects on the downstream market. So an example of such a case might be a merger between the only two coal mines in a geographic area in West Virginia. And uh, assuming there is strong uh, evidence on uh, effects on workers, um, the, both quantitative and qualitative, uh, that the merged firm will decrease the quantity of jobs that are available and put downward pressure on wages. So uh, this dovetails quite nicely with a question from the audience, um, which is, uh, what if uh, lower marginal cost as a result of a merger um, is uh, caused by monopsony power? Um, so the, the question that I'm going to uh, pose to Jeff is, do you have a concern that the consumer welfare standard, as currently applied in courts, would not capture that sort of case, would, would say that, that that harm doesn't count? Uh, yeah, well, you made it as easy as possible. I, there's no question that it would be captured. I'll, I'll just read you some of the language from the horizontal merger guidelines, for example. Mergers of competing buyers can enhance market power on the buying side of the market, just as mergers of competing sellers can enhance market power on the selling side of the market. Um, uh, agencies may conclude that the merger of competing buyers is likely to lessen competition in a manner harmful to sellers. I don't think there's any question that it comes under um, the expectations of the agencies and, and that it would be um, upheld by courts. I don't recall it having happened in a merger context, but certainly the agencies have applied um, uh, labor market monopsony sort of theories um, uh, in the Section 2 context, and uh, that doesn't seem to have been problematic. What I do think is problematic, and I'll just toss out there, is that in some of the arguments about um, uh, you know, sort of connecting social ills to, um, to increase concentration, um, and, and maybe it's just being a little bit too, too uh, lax or speaking in slogans, um, but there is, to me, an implication that monopoly power in a product market um, has a relationship and can or does cause monopsony power in the labor market. Um, and uh, to my understanding, there is absolutely no connection there at all, right? But when we talk about concentration in, in the economy and look at this and say it's a problem, we're talking about product markets, I think. Um, uh, and, and so when we then, in the next breath, say, and um, this increase in concentration has caused real problems for labor, um, I just don't think, I, and we can talk about the appropriate standard of proof, but that certainly hasn't been demonstrated, and it certainly isn't theoretically um, uh, required or even likely to be the case. Um, so, I, I mean, I have more to say on this, but um, I think it's very clear given the hypothetical. Okay. Does anybody on the panel disagree that it's clear? Well, I, I mean, it's nice in theory, but in reality, the antitrust agencies rarely look at what impact that a merger will have on labor. I think there was this recent. Um, no poaching agreement among three uh, rival equipment manufacturers. And then two of them merged. The interesting thing is if they were looking downward and you would see evidence of actual collusion, that would then suggest that the, the merger might actually make things worse. It could make things better, but it could make things worse. Because they failed to look upward, they never really saw that there was this uh, no poaching agreement. And nor did they consider then what sort of impact then that the merger might have had now, because now instead of having three competitors, you just have two. So I think this is a, a major blind spot. I mean, you've got. Do you really think that they don't? They don't. They don't know about it. I mean, you, you have you have a, a large staff of very smart and dedicated people who are poring over millions and millions of documents. I, I'm certain that they know. I'm certain that 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 everyone who has uh, anything to gain by making sure they know makes sure they know. And I'm pretty confident. I mean, this you know, I, uh, Deb and and Sharis were were getting I think a little bit 
upset on the last panel because I think there was definitely an implication that the agencies are really not doing their job. And of course, I think they're doing their job too well and they should really just knock off for a couple of years. No. But, you know, I mean, no, not I mean, really, but, I, I, but they, this is this kind of thing that you're, you're mentioning, I'm pretty sure they would notice and they would look at. No, I mean, all my time at the, uh, when I was at the agency, we did a lot of mergers. I mean, we focused primarily on downstream effects and there were occasionally that we would look upstream, but mostly downstream. We never really considered impact on labor. Sometimes they said that that's irrelevant. And then the other thing is, is that invariably, even where you know, we went to what was quantifiable. I remember one time we had this case involving white bread, and the beauty of that case was having the unilateral effects theory. I think, Carl, you were there with um, Continental Interstate Bakeries, and it was a breakthrough. But in a way, it was sort of a curse because now with the scan data, we can precisely predict what the likely price effects, and that became the sort of trigger towards unilateral effects, and I think that even had a diminishment on um, coordinated effects, even downstream. I mean, Carl, do I mean, you remember a specific case where the focus was upstream on labor in all your time at the agency? Um, well, I think we can, the FTC, um, the case just this last summer, was it Biofill? Is that somebody, help me out with that, which involved, one of the counts was um, monopsony power in several cities in acquiring uh, human plasma, uh, that the donors would not have the opportunity to uh, get a, a competitive rate for, for their donating, donating, donating their plasma. These are, I think, are generally people who have very little money. Uh, so that, that was in there. Um, now, those aren't exactly, they're not employees, but they are individuals. It's very similar. They're looking upstream. Uh, but I agree that it's not very common, okay? I mean, the DOJ has looked at it. We've done it, we, they, done it in, in um, agricultural markets sometimes involving farmers. There's a chicken processing merger case, for example. So uh, to me, it's just an open question. Uh, are there more mergers? Are there many mergers where there is a, let's just start with the obvious, is a significant increase in concentration caused by the merger in a relevant labor market, which would typically be an occupation and a fairly narrow geography. Say, okay. I don't know the answer to that. We have some data now coming out on um, uh, what the concentration of these labor markets might look like. I'm sure some are highly concentrated, certain specialties, particularly in certain areas. Um, I think that's not a bad thing for the agencies to look at. I think it has not been routine, so far as I know, to do so. Um, it's just a question of whether that would, don't want too many resources spending on that if it's if it's mostly going to be nothing going on. But in principle, that is worth looking at. Okay. I think it's, um, there's another way of looking at that, which is it's not necessarily, it, and actually what I'm about to say doesn't imply there's a necessary connection between the concept of consumer welfare and the actions of the agencies. Uh, but what we can look at is the actions of the agencies in recent years. Uh, especially the FTC. We actually have uh, my team, uh, Phil Longman from my team, put out an article just earlier this week in the Washington Monthly. I'd encourage you all to, to read it. Um, and it's looking at sort of um, uh, the FTC's enforcement actions against labor un uh, uh, individuals trying to form labor unions, individuals trying to form trade associations. You know, and in, uh, the, he starts off with a story about the move against uh, church organists. You know, I, I, I know it's a, I, you know, I, those of you who do go to church, I know that the, the organist cartel is one of the great uh, uh, threats to our republic, but they did take on, um, you know, they did devote uh, taxpayer resources to taking on the uh, church organists. Uh, they've also, in recent years, targeted ice skating instructors, animal breeders, music teachers, uh, public defenders, doctors and dentists in private practice, home health aides, uh, uh, truck and Uber drivers. Uh, you're saying that you, I think you're saying, I want to understand, that those sort of collective action by certain classes of workers or professionals, you think should be given more running room under the antitrust law, even if, let's say, it was look like a cartel type of arrangement, like a union? You, is that what you're, that direction you're a going in? A union is a cartel. Well, I understand. I'm just asking which direction yeah. you're going in. Yeah, I would say, I mean, that's exactly what we were saying, okay. is that the FTC and should probably never or extremely rarely be targeting people like church organists so and ice skating instructors. 
and uh, certainly because competition this, among them needs to be reduced for some reason. If these people choose, this is actually going back to, you know, okay. there, it's been, a, you know, we could take this back to, you know, 200 years. I mean, I'm sure you don't want me to go on another lecture about that. That's but, true. you know, it's like, the, it's, been one of, it's been one of the great freedoms in the United States is that if you are an independent actor, you can get together with your fellow workers, you can get together with your farmer with your fellow farmers, you can get together if you are an independent business person with your fellow independent business people and create unions and cooperatives and trade associations uh, to promote your joint interests. So real estate agents, for example? Should they be able to include on and well, all, actually, all different types of trade associations? Zillow, if you guys want to look at Zillow, that, I mean, if the FTC would look at Zillow, that would actually be probably pretty useful right now. Can you draw a distinction between trade associations that deserve scrutiny and trade associations that don't deserve scrutiny? Um, I, I just want to be a, a clear about what these cases are about. They're not lawsuits against individuals. They are lawsuits against trade associations, sometimes that have many uh, thousands of members. And I'd, I'd like to be uh, clear about particularly the content of the consent agreements that the FTC has reached with those trade associations. So I'm just going to, to read um, the uh, aid to an, uh, the analysis for public comment in the case against the professional skaters. Mm -hmm. uh, these are teachers of, of ice skating. And uh, the, the case involved uh, the code of ethics of the trade association. And the code of ethics states that no member shall solicit pupils of another member. And prior to acting as a coach, the member shall determine the nature and extent of any earlier teaching relationship with that skater and other members. Uh, the association enforced its code of ethics through a grievance process, which resulted in varying penalties, including suspended membership and probation. The association sanctioned coaches for soliciting students of other members, even when the students and their parents wanted to switch coaches. And being a member of the Professional Skaters Association was required to participate in competitions like uh, the US Skating Federation and to be a member of Team USA. So the question is, do you think that conduct should be legal? And, and why? Sounds a lot like the NFL. And if you, you actually, if you have like a limited amount of resources, maybe you could actually target the NFL for not uh, keeping Colin Kaepernick but, off of the... the but that's the, not off, answering the no, question. No, this is answering no, the no, question. No, no, that's an analogy. That's a, not a very good analogy. I think the question was well posed. It is a very good analogy. Well, it's a direct analogy. Okay, but fine. Whether it's, let's not argue about that. Let's just ask <laughs> the skating pack back pattern. Look, it seems to me, I just want to understand what you're saying. You're, it seems to me you're saying this group should you welcome their not competing against each other in order to get presumably higher rates and have a better life, right? And, and higher and, income. And that that should be that you welcome that. That's just what we're talking about, right? Is that right? And okay. one okay. point of car clarification. The thing is again we're dealing with limited resources in this agency. There's limited resources. I hear you guys all the time. The FTC we need more funds. The hmm. DOJ we need more funds. We so, need to pay more, you know, I've, so, I've so it's like that. with the limited resources that you have, I look around and I see many targets. I mean, we could talk about Google and Facebook monopolizing the advertising industry. But if Stripping they were just the advertising, issue, it's a, you know, it's like you got a limited number of people in, in the FTC, okay, you got a limited, so use those people carefully. But use the, the taxpayers' uh, uh, dollars wisely. Okay, so if they use the taxpayers' dollars wisely and issue a statement, about what they think would be allowed and not, okay? And then maybe there'd be private enforcement. It's not about government resources. I just want to know, this conduct that you welcome, because you seem like you welcome it, but then you say, well, I just don't want them to go after it. So I just want to understand whether this cartel-like behavior is something you welcome, or you just think it's not that bad, so they shouldn't bother. And I'd like to make one point about the resources that it took for all of these cases. Um, I actually checked with the uh, anti-competitive practices division that worked on these cases, and one attorney and no economists worked on these cases, and they weren't full time on any of these cases. They weren't litigated. They all reached a settlement that the only if you're penalty. If a church organized cartel and the FTC comes after you, you're going to give up real fast. So the, the <laughs> idea is that there would be a deterrent effect that other trade associations, perhaps trade associations that affect a larger amount of uh, economic commerce in the United States, might be deterred by engaging in similar conduct. Look, the Congress has various statutory provisions, such as particularly in the agricultural area, where 
farmers are allowed to form cooperatives, and so the Congress has made a decision that that's mm -hmm. allowed. Okay, and we that okay. I'm just saying, do you think you would go for the same type of approach for the skate for the skating coaches? I think that's what you're saying. I don't know why you're struggling. It's either yes or no. Oh, there's no struggling here. Okay, so is it yes or no? Of course. Whatever you is good, whatever rules govern the ability of farmers to come together, whatever rules govern the ability of workers to come together, any small enterprise, okay. most, you know. I just, you know, I mean, good. first, Thank the, you. That's clear now. To, um, to, to Barry's point, I mean, this, there is scholarship in, you know, academic scholarship. Um, Jack Kirkwood talked about at times when small sellers should be able to get together when they're dealing with a monopsony. And so he raises that. I mean, that was one of the concerns. So, I mean, it's not, there is literature, academic literature that supports Barry's point. I think Barry's larger point, though, is when you're looking at press resources and you look at potential harm and you look at the European Commission and what it's doing, and Carl said, I don't see any antitrust case against Facebook. Well, the Bundeskartell, we can talk about that at other points. But you do see then these other competition agencies that are engaged with these giant tech platforms and are opening up inquiries. And you see the FTC and the DOJ do basically nothing when it comes to these powerful tech platforms. That when you have one DOJ case since 2000, that's, that's this abdication. And so when you're saying we need more resources and the like, I think you have to then justify how you're using your resources and why aren't you bringing the type of cases like when Carl and I were back at the division, bringing the Microsoft case was intensive. But, but that did a lot. Are you suggesting it's because, because they think they can't win in court? I mean, that's what this is about, right? If, if all this comes down to is a different preference for, for prosecutorial discretion, um, we don't really have to have a panel about that. I, I mean, there are important questions here, as, as we were discussing a little bit earlier, with respect to, to the sort of presumptions and, and where they should be drawn. But, but the panel is about, I mean, it, that would apply to this panel if what you're saying is the way the law has developed, they don't bring those cases because they can't win them. Um, and they're relegated to bringing cases against poor, um, uh, struggling skating coaches um, because that's really where the law has left us. So is it somebody maybe that is what you're saying, but but that's a very different thing than are, are they you know do they have enough resources? Um, so I'm just going to echo what other um, enforcers in the prior administration remember, which is that we did bring close cases. Um, I personally argue the McLean case in the 11th Circuit over a fierce dissent by Josh Wright. Um, I can't count how many paper delay cases the FTC brought over the years. I, um, these also were close cases. It actually weathered a number of judicial defeats before it um, doubled down. Uh, the hospital merger cases that were deemed a dead letter back in the 90s, the FTC gathered around and um, re reformed its economic analysis and came up with a winning strategy to oppose um, anti-competitive hospital mergers. Um, I don't think the FTC has been asleep at the switch. I'm sure that if it had more resources, it would go after more anti-competitive conduct. But I don't see the FTC um, cutting very many facets of industry and kind of slack. And I'd also like to point out that if you took all of the resources that were applied to the trade association cases, you wouldn't get very far if you were going to bring another case like Microsoft with those resources. So I'd like to uh, move on to um, market structure and the 1968 merger guidelines, which uh, Barry spoke about in the last panel and has spoken about a number of times before. Um, uh, it, uh, you've uh, first point out that um, one of the primary authors of the 1968 merger guidelines was uh, was Don Turner, and Mark Niefer has an article in a past issue of Antitrust Magazine that talks about the formation of the 1968 merger guidelines um, and, uh, and how they were developed, and I'd recommend that to everybody. Um, so the 68 merger guidelines have strict structural uh, presumptions and essentially say that uh, if the market is concentrated at a certain level, uh, a, a firm with X share can't buy a firm that has Y share, and it's quite specific. And, and uh, 
I, I gather that part of Barry's admiration for the 68 guidelines is because it removes some discretion from the process. It makes it predictable, um, which I think we can all agree uh, predictability is, is generally good. Um, the question that I want to focus on relates to the specific presumptions and market share uh, requirements that are in the 1968 guidelines. And um, I want to frame that against the idea that there's quite a bit of heterogeneity in terms of how markets are structured. Um, economies of scale might be far more significant in one market compared to another, uh, which would mean that minimum efficient scale would be different in one market compared to another. Uh, and if minimum efficient scale is higher, you would expect to have fewer firms. Um, and in addition uh, to that, competition might look different in one market um, compared to another. The vertical merger panels this morning talked about uh, the Cournot model and the Bertrand model. Uh, they're very old models and uh, very simple, and I learned about them in uh, Econ 101, uh, and I think they've been developed since they were first developed, and they're much more complicated now. But the simple uh, Cournot model of duopoly, uh, producers choose quantity. In equilibrium, price is above marginal cost. Industry output is below the level that would occur under perfect competition, and there's a deadweight loss. In the Bertrand model, firms compete on price, and the basic equilibrium result is that price equals marginal cost. Output is at the competitive level, and there's no deadweight loss. So you have two uh, identical structures, and the outcomes are different. So um, given uh, the heterogeneity uh, and perhaps, depending on the circumstances, somewhat limited signal that structure provides. Uh, this is to both Barry and Maurice. I'm, I'm, I'm curious why we should focus more on structure. No, it's a great question. Um, if you don't focus on structure, if you don't have some basic goal, you end up in a winner-take-all situation. One of the, the weaknesses, as far as I understand it, of, of Carl's uh, new pr uh, proposal, <coughs> Um, and I haven't looked at it carefully, and maybe it's not true. But one of the weaknesses is that it basically, the focus on competition without a focus on market structure leads to the complete consolidation of markets. We're talking about mergers now, not I understand. conduct. But in terms of the, um, um, in terms of the, 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 you know, it's important to go back and understand what, how we saw these things for most of the 20th century. How did we see these? We carefully separated out, you know, you talked there's a lot of heterogeneity. You said there's, a, uh, it's, uh, there's uh, you know, different markets are different. That's obviously true. Um, you know, one of the things that we used to do a much better job of is clearly separating out what is a network monopoly, what is an, uh, a, a complex industrial firm that's dedicated to the application of industrial arts to uh, mass manufacture? And then what is just a business that could be handled by a family? And we had different sets of rules for each of those different areas. For most of the 20th century, when it came to farmers and, and uh, uh, small businesses, you know, uh, small shopkeepers, uh, uh, you had, the goal was actually to keep the small shopkeeper, the farmer, the independent business person in their business to avoid concentration, to prevent concentration throughout that entire political economy. Now we could debate whether that's smart or not. We could debate about whether that led to all kinds of inefficiencies. But that was the goal. And that's, it's not, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. I mean, it's like that was what people aimed at. When it came to, say, production of automobiles, the production of chemicals, later the production of semiconductors, you know, uh, the antitrust enforcers didn't say, oh, we're going to keep things really small. You know, it's like when you hold up a semiconductor chip, inside of that semiconductor chip, there's like a thousand different markets that used to exist, but they've all been vertically integrated away. So, the antitrust enforcers didn't stand in the way of the engineers who were seeking to integrate something that was much better, more effective, more beautiful. So they let that happen. But they said there's going to be a limit to the number of, amount of the market share that a car manufacturer or a semiconductor manufacturer or a, uh, a, a chemical manufacturer can have. And that's about one quarter of the marketplace. If you go above that, then we're going to have to start really talking about that. 
And then when it came to network monopolies, communications firms and railroads, there were some really simple rules that were applied to them. No vertical integration, no discrimination. Now this was a this wasn't all under the, the roof of antitrust. This is under the roof of anti-monopoly. This is under the roof of the US government. You know, so it's like we can't say that it's all it's up entirely to the antitrust people to come up with this regime. The American people came up with this regime. We we ran it for a long time and it did a lot of things really well. To those who didn't want to boss, they could go in and have uh, run their own farm or run their own business. To those who wanted to go in the industrial system and be an employee, they could do that. You also had back then a, a, a pretty strong right to unionize if you're in an industrial company. And then if when the, when all individual producers, all individual businesses, and all individual consumers came to the intermediate companies, the communications firms, and the transportation firms, there was various forms of common carriage to keep those enterprises neutral and to ensure that the mass of political power in any enterprise was not being misused to concentrate political power, as we see today with the communications and transportation network monopolies of today, which are Google and Facebook and Amazon. So, so uh, there's a lot of different approaches, and we have to actually understand how to use these approaches to I, deal with the actual problem at hand. That is I, not I, the answer I expected when asked about Cornell versus Bertrand, I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to give Maurice a chance to respond to that question sure. because he emphasized uh, structure in his opening presentation. Yeah, so I go back to whenever I'm in doubt, I, I think of Bernie Hollander, for those of you who know, who spent many years at the um, DOJ. And his fav I asked him one time, who's his favorite AAG? And he said it was Stanley Barnes. And Stanley Barnes, during the Eisenhower administration, said in his study of the antitrust laws that legal requirements are prescribed by legislatures and courts, not by economic science. And I heard earlier today that, well, we're in the prediction business. First off, we don't know how accurate we are in our predictions. Nobody knows. I mean, you would think we would, I mean, and I think this is commendable about the FTC in the um, hospital retrospectives, they could actually change the law. But we don't know how accurately we're actually predicting price effects. Now, John Kowaka looked at the um, post-merger uh, reviews. Some of you have problems with that. He himself identified limitations with that. But it's questionable to what extent we're actually accurately predicting price effects. The other thing is the, we're not arguing that these mergers are per se illegal. We're just saying that it switches the presumption because there are things that are measurable and there are things that aren't measurable. And those things that aren't measurable can be as important if not more important. So another person when you go to doubt is Hayek. Hayek said that in many of the sciences What's measurable is what's important. But for economics, what's measurable isn't what's important. And what we're seeing now is evidence of a market power problem that doesn't come necessarily from efficiencies. And you're seeing an inverted U relationship with respect to innovation that when you can have very high concentration, that can actually have an adverse effect on innovation. So what we propose, and this is currently legislation, is that when you're having markets like this, and that could address then what Carl talked about, the incipiency, is when you have a company that's already a monopoly, you could then deal with the Alcoa Rome situation, where a monopoly then acquires a very small firm. And the reason why I think this is important with dataopolis is this. Back in the 90s, Microsoft didn't really have a great sense of where um, consumers were going. But in controlling these platforms right now, they can see what are some of the nascent competitive threats? What apps are being downloaded and like? And that gives them an insight, and we call this the now casting radar. And that's a concern, because they could see trends possibly before the antitrust um, division or the FTC, and they can eliminate those nascent competitive threats, either by buying them or subtly engaging in pressure that the agency won't necessarily pick up, and then you can have a market power problem. So that's why we propose then reversing the um, burden on, on mergers. 
Um, can, can I just go ahead, respond? Go ahead, go ahead. The question was about the, the economic theory has different predictions about oligopoly. So how do we deal with it? How, how can we have this structural presumption because we don't really know that much? And I guess I have a paper with Herb Hovenkamp pretty recently about the importance of the structural presumption where Herb on the law basically says, look, it's a very, very solid law going back to Philadelphia National Bank and we need to strengthen it. And I say more on the economic side, there's a lot of good economics supporting the structural presumption. So I think it's true in any given market, it can be very hard to predict. This is kind of the point about if you look for specific numbers, it's going to be hard. And the structural presumption is a way to cut through that in a pro to help enforcement in a lot of respects. And so I think we need to strengthen it. So I, but, but, but while recognizing it's hard to predict and markets are different. And that's, I think, why the merger guidelines, you know, what the agencies can do is go beyond, they're not just going to do what they did in 68, right? They're going to go and look more carefully about, okay, here, this is, what do we know about the way the market's evolving and all these other things and try to look at effects and not just structure. But it really, it's a different process at the courts than at the agencies. There's different institutional competences. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I do think you want to, what you can do in a few cases where you can look deeply to help make a better enforcement decision is quite differently when you get into court where the structural presumptions valuable and needed even though it is, and because it's hard to predict. Can I, can I just Go ahead, add, add one little quick thing, which is, which is um, precisely that process. You know, th there is uncertainty. There is obviously administrative value to, to, to presumptions. It helps if they're actually grounded in, in you know, some sort of reason to think that they cut one direction or the other, but even that's not required for administrability purposes. Um, but what's great about the system we have now is that if the economy changes or if a particular market changes in such a way that it, the structural presumption doesn't really make much sense anymore, um, th there is at least a process by which it can be adjudicated in court. And, and the courts, over time, will adjust the way they approach the structural presumption. What would be the worst of all possible worlds is imposing an inviolable structural presumption that, that isn't subject to any kind of amendment. By as, as a litigator, as I, I can tell you that nothing's inviolable because the well, antecedent okay, question enough, of how you define markets is ultimately. <laughs> whenever I say inviolable, assume I mean relatively. <laughs> but I don't think we'd want to go back to where it would be right. irrebuttable, for right. example, which it was kind of close in 68, mm -hmm. right? Or, yeah, the, we, or, or right. if they had passed any of the Industrial yes. um, uh, okay. Reorganization but, Acts. I mean, say, I wouldn't want to go back there. Maybe some others here would, but that's I just want to I'm against about, that. I, I'm just saying I, I agree with, with what you're saying, and I I'm, I'm just want to make sure it's clear that part of the benefit is that it can actually adjust over time. Uh, I said I was going to get into more uh, specific uh, fact patterns or hypotheticals, um, and I'm not going to do that with this question because uh, there are two uh, posing questions from the audience, uh, and it's too delightful not to ask them, and they're very high-level questions. So one, um, if the consumer in the consumer welfare standing or in the consumer welfare standard is so confusing, why not use a total welfare standard? And the other question is, uh, can we please put the total welfare standard to bed? Uh, so I will uh, pose that question to the panel and see if anybody wants to uh, articulate a defense of the total welfare standard. Go ahead, Jeff. Surprising, isn't it? Uh, it's not that I'm going to articulate a defense of the total welfare standard. I, I'm actually going to use it to do two things. Number one, to point out that the re one of the reasons we have a consumer welfare standard um, uh, as a sort of stand-in for um, total welfare standard is because it is itself actually a, um, a compromise for the sake of uh, economizing and, and the like on the understanding that producers um, benefit when consumers benefit, but also benefit if they can take advantage of consumers. Uh, we basically say, well, look, you know, and, but it's, and it's hard to distinguish between the two. Well, let's not look at the welfare of, um, of producers. We'll look at the welfare of consumers, and we'll capture most of it. Um, and, and there's a number of other reasons, too, that the consumer welfare standard is sort of a stand-in for total welfare. It's not perfect, of course, and in a, in a sort of ideal world, if we were social engineers, we might actually want a, a total welfare standard if we could be sure that that it wasn't, that, that we were actually increasing total welfare. And the problem is, of course, the uncertainty, the amb ambiguity, uh, and the like, and that's, again, precisely why we have the standard that we do use. M moving even farther, further away from that, I guess, would make sort of even less sense to me, especially when it's justified on the basis that, um, uh, of the problems of uncertainty. And, and again, I think it's sort of what we've been 
dancing around quite a bit here. That is, the, of course, there is a benefit to increasing administrability and, and reducing uncertainty, um, but it doesn't help you any if you're reducing uncertainty um, in, in a direction that actually is the opposite of the direction you want to go. So you want to have some basis for, for the sort of presumption you apply. Um, uh, I think that's what we've done with the consumer welfare standard. But if we had the mechanism to relatively reliably and inexpensively adopt a total welfare standard, I'd be all for it. Go ahead, yeah. Morris. I would um, do a shout out to um, Marshall and then also um, Mark um, Glick. Mark Glick has just recently come out with a paper, and, and, and Marshall was, was emphasizing this with me, is that total welfare is unworkable in a, when we rely on a partial equilibrium uh, model. And particularly, like, we don't even capture, like, the earlier question had something about reduction in marginal cost. Normally, we look at that as a good thing, but what if that reduction of marginal cost is actually at the expense upstream on labor or farmers and the like? We're not necessarily capturing that. So when we're talking, I mean, we can't even capture innovation or quantify privacy, quantify quality and the like. And we can't even do that under, under a partial equilibrium model. How would we then try to determine all of the effects that a merger might have on a, um, on, on a total economy? And, I, and, I'm, and Marshall can add to that, but, but that, that's my understanding. Okay, I'd like to move on to think about, and, and this is going to be geared first to, at you, Maurice, uh, to think about how your proposed standard would handle a specific example of, of conduct. So when I think about welfare or welfare analysis, I think about how, how do we think about trade-offs. And um, agencies and courts often have to make trade-offs um, in part because the evidence that uh, we, we are looking at um, is ambiguous. Uh, so there, the facts might support a plausible claim of exclusion or predation, but also might support uh, a claim that the conduct benefits consumers or, or creates uh, efficiencies. Um, and uh, I think I'll focus specifically on predatory pricing, but you can think about this uh, in terms of vertical restraints, uh, and you could think about this in terms of innovation that some might call predatory innovation. But I, I think we'll focus on predatory pricing. Um, so the, the challenge in, in identifying the correct legal standard uh, is to pick a standard that helps the decision maker distinguish between uh, beneficial conduct and harmful conduct when uh, in, at a very high level, uh, the conduct looks like it could be, could be both. Um, the D.C. Circuit in Microsoft said, uh, the challenge for an antitrust court lies in stating a general rule for distinguishing between exclusionary acts, which reduce social welfare, and competitive acts, which uh, I increase it. So um, in, in the context of a predatory pricing allegation, uh, how would your standard operate? You have an uh, example of uh, a... Uh, a company offering low prices. So, you know, the, the first cut is to ask whether those prices are below cost. Um, and, uh, and second, would it matter if the seller uh, offers multiple products? So here I'm trying to capture uh, what you might think about uh, loss leading or how your standard might analyze loss leading. Okay, sure. So, um, yeah, actually, uh, we taught uh, predatory pricing um, yesterday in class. And what we propose is basically what the standard is currently in Europe, whereby if a dominant firm is engaged in sustained pricing that's below average variable costs, or let's say marginal costs, or another appropriate cost measure, then that is presumptively um, anti-competitive. And you don't necessarily have to prove recoupment. Now, I think Carl said that, you know, the recoupment, well, we can talk about the recoupment. I think if my understanding, I mean, going around antitrust circles, that after Liggett, there hasn't been any successful predation case brought by either agency. Correct me if I'm wrong. And the only one that we were able to get is where um, Spirit Airlines survived summary judgment. Um, I do know that um, Bruce Brugman brought a predatory pricing case under California state law where there wasn't a recoupment against New Times, and I think he prevailed. But I'm unfamiliar with any successful predatory pricing case since that decision. Now, I, and, and I'm interested because um, Spencer Weber Waller is also doing a paper on this. And so what we propose is something that's already now employed in Europe, 
and it would foster then greater convergence. Well, so, I mean, you're describing a can I go ahead? Yeah. So, I mean, you're describing a set of circumstances in which a regulator, let's say, has accurately found that a producer is pricing on a sustained basis below marginal cost. Either that um, producer is acting irrationally, or it expects to recoup those losses at some point. Um, so, if if you just assume that most businesses operate rationally, then recoupment is more or less built into a finding of genuine long-term, uh, I'm sorry, not long-term, but genuine sustained below marginal cost pricing. Right, and there you have like let's go back to uh, Liggett. There you had 18 months pricing below average variable cost. And there was strong evidence of anti-competitive intent, predatory intent. So here, the company believed in what it was doing. And the majority was rather paternalistic. They said, no, despite what you may believe, you could not prevail in this market. And I think this is where Justice Stevens says in this dissent that in that market, they knew how to dance this dance very well. So there, there, there are a couple questions here. What, one of them is um, how often is this really a problem and what are the costs of false positives and false negatives? What are the error costs in this context? And I think in that respect, Justice Breyer um, and Barry Wright got it exactly right, which is you don't want to create systemic disincentives for companies to lower prices. That's not to say that there cannot be successful prosecutions for predation, but the theory of those prosecutions has to be that at some point, consumers will be net worse off than they would be in the absence of the strategy. I think it's important to throw into this mix. I mean, the notion of recruitment here, I think, as it's been discussed and probably in most people's minds, is, is the company prices below cost, and then at some time in the future, they recoup that somehow through some positive margins. Let me just suggest, and this relates to your question about multi-product, is that you really have to be careful. I think if a, if a monopolist is pricing below a proper appropriate measure of cost, that they have some explaining to do. That's how I think about it. Now, they, there's different ways they could explain it. Okay, the way that would favor the, that might be worse worrisome. They say, yeah, we're going to drive everybody out, and then we're going to make the money later. Okay, by jacking the price. Well, that's what we're worried about. But what if they say, well, no, actually, what's happened is. We're actually at a fairly smaller scale of production right now, so it's actually pretty expensive. Imagine it's an automobile or something or some other manufacturing item. But we know that by, by getting down the learning curve and getting scale, we're going to get our costs down. And we're trying to get there, and we'll get there faster. Okay? So is that a defense? Okay, well, the economics of that would say, well, actually, if you look at the economics of learning by doing, um, uh, that the, by producing more today, you learn and produce less in the future, the currently measured cost of that car is actually not the right measure of cost because you get some future benefits on the cost side due to scale. So you have to measure it correctly. It might look like they're below cost, but not really. Another one would be, you know, lastly, they sell this product because it's bringing people in the door and they're going to buy some other products. Just the same transaction or the same month. That's not a temporal recoupment. So I think you need to be careful. But if it really is temporal recoupment in the future, that, then they, that, that's more suspicious. Um, but I don't know how you can do no, that. All should fit fine within the are the trading bar. The customer is ultimately hurt. So I don't think any of this disturbs the use of the protecting competition standard, no matter how you come out. And I tend to come out thinking that in Brook Group, the court put in too many hurdles, and that's why we don't see any plaintiffs really bringing much less winning these cases. That's not why we don't see it because it doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, or or or, or there's say, no way to tell that that's not the reason. I mean, uh, well, I'm, I'm saying the standard is overly restrictive. No, no, but and even therefore, with, it but, is reasonable to infer or it's properly that there may. There, well, I'm saying overly, and you're saying properly. No, I know, but, but what I'm saying is that, that the fact that that it's hard to bring one of these cases is not itself any evidence whatsoever that we don't have enough of those cases. You may be able to point to the specific restrictions in the economic literature and say, "Hey, given what we know, this is actually too restrictive." That's something very different. That's not what Maurice's point was. Maurice was saying, well, clearly it's not, it's too overly restrictive because well, we don't have any cases. But well, we, those are not. I didn't mean to make that no, syllogism yeah, just like that. that yeah. Well, let me just quickly, I mean, you're, you're right. But one of the things, if you look at some of the research among firms, it's like what are sort of acts that you engage in to um, thwart rivals? 
Um, there was an old study uh, about this, but one of the things that they cited was predatory pricing. So, I mean, I think it's an empirical thing is to see to what extent is that occurring and what is it, um, and I think there, look at other jurisdictions, look at states, see this type of claims that are being brought, and then that can tell you how often it actually occurs. I think a lot uh, of the, uh, the, the wait, analysis. Can I, can I actually? Uh, go ahead, you go ahead Barry. Yeah. Barry was. Yeah, sure. uh, we got, I guess, five minutes left. Um, this has been a fascinating last five minutes, I, I thought. <laughs> I was just, you know, on the edge of my seat. Um, you know, but actually, Jeff Mann said something really uh, important earlier today, which is this isn't just a discussion about consumer welfare. This is a discussion about bigger issues. So um, I'm going to. I want to do a little quote here, another one. This is from our friend Bob Petoskey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, I have and, one and, final question that I want to ask the panel, so yeah. you've got like 30 and, no, seconds. No, like, 30 this seconds, is, Barry. This is, this is actually this is very pertinent. No, no, no. 30 seconds, Barry. Antitrust is about more than economics. This is Bob Petoskey in the late 1990s when he was the head of the FTC. If someone monopolizes the cosmetics field, they're going to take money out of consumers' pockets. That's kind of like the conversation we just had. But the implications for democratic values are zero. On the other hand, if they monopolize books, you're talking about implications that go way beyond the wholesale price, what the wholesale price of books might be. Um, we have, uh, uh, my organization back on June 12th, okay. we had Macon Del Rahim come to, uh, to, uh, to this event that I helped. You're, you're over 30 seconds, Barry. So uh, you know, it's like, uh, we're gonna, uh, are we going to talk about only consumer welfare and leave the big issues on the table? What I actually would like Mr. Uh, Shapiro to actually tell me is how in his new system that he has come up with, under this new standard, how are you going to deal with the monopolization that is taking place of the advertising industry that it supports and has supported for more than 200 years. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to move on, and we're going to talk about um, Supreme Court cases. So uh, this is a question for every member of the panel. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a magic wand, and uh, the magic wand allows you to strike any decision on the books by the Supreme Court. And uh, the question is, um, it, it's the a antitrust related. Antitrust related, yes, yes. But, yeah, <laughs> antitrust decision, yeah. That's not a, a can of worms that I. Bob would Petoskey like to open. felt that it was antitrust related. So uh, the question is, what's what, happened since Bob Petoskey was the head of this? In, uh, so the question is, agency. what decision would you choose to strike and why? And in particular, why is the decision that you choose inconsistent with your view um, uh, about how the agency should be evaluating uh, antitrust cases under your preferred standard? I'm just going to pick the case I hate the most um, after I thought about your question last night. I'm not sure it does a lot of damage anymore. The case was Utah Pie, which was an absolutely insane predatory pricing case. Happy to describe the facts, but I think we're going to take up too much time doing it. Okay, Carl? I would strike Citizens United, but I'm not sure <laughs> that's an antitrust case, so I would go with M American Express. Uh, Barry? American uh, Express. On, on the, and by the way, I think you asked how it's consistent. It, I think in that case, the conduct clearly disrupted the competitive process, harmed the trading partners, the merchants, disrupted price competition, and uh, in the Supreme Court, uh, you should read Breyer's dissent. It's really sparkling. Uh, Barry. I agree with Carl. Maurice. See, so, yeah, I don't think uh, a magic wand. Dissent, man. We're totally <laughs> aligned, I can tell. <laughs> well, I, I agree with both of them, but here's the thing. I don't think it's a magic wand of one case. What I would, and I would point out Ligon, not because I necessarily disagreed with the result, but what I saw particularly pernicious in Ligon, what I see in antitrust generally, is number one, how bad dicta then takes a life of its own, where in Sylvania, in a the footnote, they said the primary purpose is inter-brand competition. Number two is how the court then basically said it's untethered. It's not really bound by stare decisis. It's not necessarily bound by the legislative aim. It really just then determines what it finds as the prevailing economic wisdom, which is really dangerous then when you have an unmoored Supreme Court. Okay. Jeff. Uh, I'm going to say if, uh, if, if Maurice and Barry at all uh, get their way, it has to be Chevron. Um, because we are absolutely going to need checks on agency and executive discretion. Uh, but if you insist on an actual antitrust case, um, I, I, the easy answer, I guess, would be Philadelphia National Bank. Um, so now, now that we have uh, roughly 100 seconds left, I'm going to give you 
uh, 100 seconds to criticize the FTC and no more than 100 seconds. So this magic wand allows you to change any decision my, made by the FTC over the last 20 years. This could include a case that was not pursued but should have been, a case that settled but should have been litigated, a case that was pursued but should not have been, or something else. Um, and I'm encouraging you to focus on a decision made by the agency, not uh, the effect of some decision, like uh, the moderator will consider something like the 11th Circuit should have decided shearing plow the other way, a cop out. So we'll go with John. Uh, I'm gonna, as the commission's former lawyer, I'm gonna take a hard pass on okay. that one. <laughs> My mother taught me when someone invites you over, you're gracious, <laughs> so I will decline. Okay. Well, uh, FTC should have taken down Google. Maurice. Yeah, I mean, I think Google double click, what I've heard throughout the day would, I, I mean, I don't necessarily fault the agency at that time, although I think you had some good dissent in that case, but I would think that and some of the other Google transactions certainly warrant a post-merger retrospective. Okay. Jeff. Uh, Libby Anchor Hawking and uh, Whole Foods Wild Oats. Uh, um, I think that uh, and there are others too, but those in particular were sort of pernicious in, in the extent to which they relied on channels of distribution to define markets uh, um, and wrote out any possibility of supply side substitution. So we have uh, 10 seconds left, which is not enough time for another question. I just want to say to all of you, it was a, a delight, uh, one of the highlights of, of my year so far to be moderating this panel, and I'd like to encourage everybody to uh, give the panelists a big round of applause. So uh, I'd like everybody on the panel to stay in their seats because we have uh, closing remarks from our newest commissioner, uh, Commissioner Christine Wilson. Good afternoon, everybody. It is great to be back here at my alma mater talking about one of my favorite topics, antitrust law. And I'm going to sound like a geek when I say it, but talking about my two favorite subtopics of antitrust law, the appropriate welfare standard and vertical mergers. Because I want to get you home in time for dinner, I'm only going to talk about vertical mergers. Um, I'll save consumer welfare for another day. So it's, um, it, it is good to be back here with, um, you know, on, on Steve Stallop's stomping grounds. He was a, a professor of mine when I was here. I think I took every single class that he offered, and I, I was his research assistant. So as, as he will be able to attest, I've been thinking about vertical mergers for many years. Uh, while I was his research assistant, one of my first jobs was to do research in conjunction with his draft paper on vertical mergers. And that draft paper eventually became the article that he and Michael Reardon published in the Antitrust Law Journal. So with the benefit of both that research and subsequent developments in the law and in policy, I'd like to discuss three core points on which I believe there is broad agreement. First, sound vertical merger policy requires a firm economic foundation. The legality of a transaction depends on its likely economic effects. Forecasting those effects, in turn, requires a clear understanding of the underlying economic principles. So stepping back, vertical mergers, as we've heard today, bring together firms at different levels of production, whereas horizontal mergers bring together firms that compete at the same level. So horizontal mergers combine substitutes, like two brands of soft drinks. And vertical mergers involve complements, such as soft drink manufacturers like Coke and Pepsi, and the downstream firms that bottle and distribute their products. So for many years, economists disputed whether and to what extent vertical restraints and vertical mergers raise competitive concerns. George Hay once said that vertical mergers are the area of greatest disagreement among lawyers and economists. And another one of my mentors, University of Florida professor Roger Blair, made an even stronger assertion. In his 1983 book on vertical integration, Blair said that vertical mergers are an intellectual battleground akin to the Mekong Delta. And if you watched a couple of the earlier panels today, you might understand what he meant. 
So the battle, battle on vertical mergers was slowly won by those who believed vertical mergers were less likely to raise competitive concerns than horizontal mergers. Writing in the 1950s, when the law treated vertical and horizontal arrangements in a similar fashion, Bob Bork wrote that a comparison of the law and the economics of vertical integration makes clear that the two bear little resemblance. Of course, that was long before GTE Sylvania, let alone Legion. And by 1991, Judge Doug Ginsburg was describing the rule for vertical restraints as one of de facto legality, a characterization that my friend Professor Danny Sokol echoed after the Supreme Court decided Legion. But in his article in the Antitrust Law Journal, Steve Salop identified several potential harms flowing from vertical mergers. And if you were here this morning, you heard his thoughts on the circumstances under which vertical mergers could give rise to anti-competitive effects. That said, a number of other panelists today took issue both with the scenarios that Steve outlined and with our ability to apply those theories in a rigorous and systematic way. Many of the panelists seem to say that vertical mergers are less likely to raise competitive concerns than horizontal mergers. And this sentiment echoes a 2007 joint submission to the OECD Competition Committee in which both DOJ and the FTC said vertical mergers merit a stronger presumption of being efficient than do horizontal mergers and should be allowed to proceed except in those few cases where convincing fact-based evidence relating to the specific circumstances of the vertical merger indicates likely competitive harm. And they drew on this conclusion largely because, as Bruce Hoffman explained earlier this year, a vertical merger both reduces or eliminates transaction costs and can eliminate the double marginalization problem. So we're left with two important empirical questions. First, are vertical mergers more likely to generate efficiencies that, on balance, fully offset their anti-competitive harms? And second, are those efficiencies merger-specific? Ultimately, the answer to these two questions will determine whether the agencies should continue to believe that vertical mergers are less likely than horizontal ones to raise competitive concerns. Here's the good news. An economist friend of mine once quipped that the benefit of an empirical question is that the answer is knowable. So that's precisely why the Commission historically has conducted merger retrospectives and, under Chairman Simons, will continue this important work. On to my second point, although a sound economic foundation is necessary, the facts are often determinative. Or, as that joint OECD submission put it, our analysis in each case necessarily depends upon the specific circumstances of each vertical merger. Two vertical merger cases from my last tour of duty at the Commission illustrate this point neatly. So let me take you back to 2002. Salt Lake City hosted the Winter Olympics. Star Wars II was in movie theaters, and I was chief of staff to Chairman Tim Muris. That summer, the commission decided two vertical merger cases. In the first one, SciTech sought to acquire Digene. Both companies made products that screened for a particular type of cancer, but the products were complements. There was also some evidence that products might, in the future, become substitutes. These facts led the FTC to vote 5-0 to challenge the merger. In its challenge, the Commission argued the combined firm would have the ability and the incentive to foreclose both an existing competitor and new entrants, and the parties ultimately abandoned the deal. But at the same time, the Commission cleared a second vertical merger without a remedy. This was the proposed merger of Synopsys and Avant. The products here were complements, in this case used at different stages of the process to design computer chips. And after a thorough investigation, then Bureau Director Simons concluded, at bottom, there just wasn't enough evidence that Synopsys would have either the incentive or the ability to foreclose competitive products sufficiently to harm consumers. And customers were also supportive of the deal believing it would allow the merged company to more efficiently design next-generation computer chips. So in short, the FTC had two simultaneous vertical mergers that it was evaluating, 
it was being decided uh, by the same bureau director and the same commissioners, and it posed the same legal and economic questions. But the facts of those two cases differed materially, and thus the outcomes were different. And so, as I said, facts matter. And my third point, if the economic theory and the facts suggest that a remedy is necessary, obviously we must ensure the remedy we seek is appropriate. Enforcers seek to preserve the competition otherwise lost as a result of the merger while permitting the parties to achieve the efficiencies of vertical integration. Historically, the agencies have done so by imposing firewalls, non-discrimination obligations, and transparency provisions. For example, the Commission imposed a firewall in the two vertical mergers involving carbonated soft drink manufacturers and their bottlers. And the Commission continues to take that approach today, most recently when it imposed two of those remedies, a firewall and a non-discrimination provision, as a condition of allowing Northrop Grumman to acquire the upstream firm Orbital ATK. But in recent years, there's been some discussion about whether the agencies should consider remedies beyond those that I just mentioned. Some, like the antitrust division under Christine Varney, have advocated for a broader set of behavioral remedies. Others, like the antitrust division under Macon Delrahim, express a preference for structural relief and vertical mergers. And that discussion continues today. Last month, Mick and Delrahim announced the withdrawal of the 2011 edition of the uh, Division's Guide to Merger Remedies in favor of the 2004 edition. And just two days ago, he announced his intention to issue new vertical merger guidelines. In the second panel today, several participants agreed that updated agency guidance would be useful and that the topic of remedies should be included. At both agencies, the choice of remedy necessarily depends upon the assessment of a merger's likely effects, which is an empirical question. As I mentioned a moment ago, the Commission believes that these questions are best answered with strong empirical work. The Commission has already released two studies examining the efficacy of its merger remedies, and I hope that this work continues. The information we glean from this kind of analysis will help us refine our approach to crafting vertical merger remedies and calibrate our overall enforcement efforts. So to conclude, so I can get you home in time for dinner, today's panels continue a long-standing debate. And while there's plenty of scope for disagreement, there's also broad agreement on three core points. First, sound vertical merger policy requires a firm economic foundation. Second, the facts of each, each case matter a great deal. And third, if a remedy is necessary, we as enforcers must think hard which remedy is best positioned to preserve the competition that would otherwise be eliminated by the proposed transaction. So in closing, I'd like to thank all of the panelists, and particularly Steve Salop, who I don't see at the moment, for their participation in today's sessions. Uh, the participation of all of the panelists in the sessions that we've already had in today's sessions and in the sessions to come will be incredibly valuable as the FTC continues grappling with these important issues. Thanks. <laughs>